This episode was brought to you by Big Moose. Find out about the One Million Project at bigmoosecharity.co. Pals, greetings. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Everything Endurance. It is, as always, a pleasure to be back in your ears. Now, uh, you know, I've been consistently inconsistent over the years. Um, I'm sure you've got used to it by now. No podcast for a while and then two turn up at once. And uh, here we are again with two sort of back-to-back releases. Um, Just to carry on being consistent or inconsistently consistent, um, this race is another cold weather race. We're going to be talking about another experience in the Arctic. Now, whereas this time it was very much spine race themed and the competitors were on skis and pulling polks through the snow, this time around we're in beyond the ultimate territory and we're going to be talking about the ice ultra. So very much backpacks and snowshoes instead of skis. Also, the ice ultra is a five-day race, stages, with somewhere to camp out overnight. But Don't let that for a second fool you into thinking this is in any way an easy race. Obviously, I'm going to add the caveat here that I particularly like talking about the Ice Ultra on this podcast because it is my one claim to being a multi-stage ultra runner myself, it being the only multi-day event I've ever participated in, rather than just followed around writing social media updates and taking photos with my camera. This is my one claim to uh, ultra running ultra running stardom is is having finished this race so i'm particularly happy to be wanging on about it again on account of the fact that i get to drop that into the conversation here and there it's a tough event it's in swedish lapland over five days the runners are in lightweight kit and anything they need for that race is going to be carried on their backs so these guys are carving toothbrushes down to get rid of grams out of their kit such is the administrative nous needed to uh, survive in this environment. Now, before I start talking about the Ice Ultra at length, before I introduce those guests, I'm going to make the most of this opportunity to congratulate Jasmine Paris on finishing the Barclay Marathons. If you're unfamiliar with the Barclay Marathons, and you're listening to this podcast, I have no idea how you've managed that, but go back a whole bunch of episodes and you will find a lengthy interview with Laz Lake, um, the founder of that event, and you will learn everything you need to know back there. Go back to about this time last year in the podcast, and you will in fact find an interview with two of this year's finishers um, talking about their experiences in the Tennessee Hills this time last year. But Go Google it, come back armed, and drop back into this podcast here. I am congratulating Jasmine Paris on being the first female athlete to finish the Barclay Marathons, which is just astonishing and just a brilliant end to her story. She's she's taken a few runs at this, developed every time, and we already knew she was an absolutely exceptional runner. I, I count myself so, so very privileged to have been at the finish line when she took a 12-hour bite out of the course record of the spine race back in January 2019. We always knew she was amazing, and she's just shown the entire world. And the entire world seems to have stood up and paid attention, quite rightly. So, absolutely amazing, no less than she deserves. And we're not stopping there. Also, congratulations to Eor Veris, who, I mean, how amazing his first attempt at the course. Not only has he finished at the first attempt, but he finished first on his first attempt, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Then you've got John Kelly, um, who already held the record for being the most featured guest on this podcast, is no doubt going to see soon that he's had another email from me. Um, and managed to get his third finish in seven attempts. There's also Jared Campbell in there, who's now finished four times. Some people never learn. Presumably, he's going to go back and do it again. What can you do? But uh, absolutely incredible, Jared Campbell, four times now. And Craig Hamilton of New Zealand, who uh, also bagged a finish. Absolutely amazing. Um, Now, I'm going to also drop in here a, a sort of mixed commiserations and congratulations to Damien Hall. Um, I love you, dude. 
that was amazing and that you have so narrowly avoided finishing that race again just shows how incredible you are as an athlete because you got so far and you got one step closer and let it be known I have a particularly strong cup of tea here next to me in your honour now back from Tennessee and over to Swedish Lapland let's get into today's guests I've got three for you today first up Taryn Gordon Bennett Um, She is speaking to me all the way from South Africa, and she was the female winner of the Ice Ultra this year. She is followed by Alex O'Shea, the uh, winning male and winner overall, who you may know better as the running fireman on Instagram. He is an Irish athlete with some big records behind him, and we talk about them as well as his Ice Ultra experience. Then you've got Sia Kindberg, who is possibly the most positive person I've ever spoken to. Please, though this is a long episode, make sure you listen to Sia. I mean, it. I know that uh, a lot of the people who listen to this podcast really enjoy hearing from the athletes who were maybe in the not-quite-as-fast category, who got maximum value out of the event by spending the most possible time on the course, And it is always good to hear from completers. It is a different approach to races. You are out there for a longer period of time and there is an an enormous amount of value in what she has to say. Uh, If you are on the fence about taking on some big adventure at the moment, then I warn you, if you listen to Sia's interview, you will almost certainly press the green button or whatever it is you need to do and end up signing up for that thing. Um, So yeah, you were warned. Be more seer. She's brilliant. Now, without further ado, I think uh, you've once more heard enough of me. I'm going to introduce the first guest. So welcome, Taryn. Good afternoon, Taryn. Taryn, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, How are you? Sitting in South Africa? A uh, gorgeous day, but um, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> I don't wait. I tell you what, it's not too bad a day where I am at the moment. I'm, uh, you know, South Yorkshire, UK, about ten degrees. Not not far off average for this time of year. I imagine it's a little warmer where you are, which will have been a lot warmer than where you were when you won the Ice Ultra. Absolutely. It's now currently about thirty-two degrees in South Africa, and the Ice Ultra was probably. That's in minus, so minus 36 degrees. So very happy where I'm at at the moment. In fact, I'm still defrosting, so very happy. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that kind of leads me into something that I, I, I do like to ask people about after these things, which was how was the recovery from it? You know, how, did wow. you bounce back quickly and get back to running or are you just no. getting back to it now? I wish I wish you could just bounce back off to five days of running an ultra marathon every day. And yeah. uh, and running, running in minus uh, twenty plus degrees. No, it's taken a while. Um, I'm still busy recovering. Uh, I've gone for a few runs. I've gone for about four or five runs since I've returned. One or two yoga classes, a few swims, one one or two bike rides. So very chilled. But uh, from next week, I need to start getting stuck in again. But the recovery hasn't been easy. I've been eating everything that my eyes have seen, and uh, and sleep. Just been wanting to sleep. If it's any reassurance at all, in my experience, that's absolutely normal. People do seem to go through this period of time after one of these races where they just cannot stop eating. Like your body is trying to replace everything you lost across that week. Uh, yeah. Well, enjoy it while it lasts. You've got a really good okay. excuse here to just eat whatever you like. <laughs> um, so I- I've managed to get this far. Without saying congratulations, you having been a winner out there at the Ice Ultra, which is absolutely incredible. Um, first female athlete, sixth overall, 12 hours, somewhere along those lines, ahead of your nearest rival on the podium. Those are some yeah. pretty impressive numbers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, congratulations. You deserve it. Um, before we dig into the actual experience out there at the Ice Ultra, this being the first time we've sort of talked on the podcast, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about, about Taryn and how you came to be on that start line in the first place. So sure. was was a big multi-day race like this a, a bit of a new experience for you? And what on earth made you choose the Ice Ultra when you're used to being in 30 degree temperatures at home? 
So I'm actually um, an ex ballet dancer. Um, uh-huh. So I I danced my entire life. Um, I danced for a dance company. Um, so I've always been active. Um, I then took on running. Um, I've ran a lot of big races, comrades, um, two oceans, uh, the big races in South Africa, so 90 kilometers uh, on tar, and then 56 kilometers again on tar. And I got a little bit tired of running on tar. So then I then moved to trail running, which is amazing. I love it. Um, and I have competed quite a few big ultras Yeah, again in South Africa. Uh, Mac Mac, I uh, was the second lady in, you know, I've done quite a few. So, um, never really taken it too seriously. Um, you know, the races that I have participated in, I have come sort of in the top, you know, three, maybe six. Um, but you know, just picking over, I've got a full time job. Um, so very difficult to, to get the training in. Um, I've also done Ironman. I completed Ironman, um, the African Championship in, um, it was April 2022. Um, I was, I came in in the top five. I was, uh, invited or I qualified for, um, the Grail of Ironman, which was held in Hawaii, Kona. Amazing. Uh, and yeah, it was absolutely amazing. But what's even more bizarre is that it was my, actually my first full Ironman because when I completed the PE, the Port Elizabeth Ironman in South Africa, the swim was cancelled. So when I was invited oh. to <laughs> when I was invited to Hawaii, um, it was actually my first full um, Ironman, and it was World Camp. So I was a little bit nervous. So you are competing with five thousand of the best, most fittest athletes in the world. And yeah, I'm standing at the start line going, oh my gosh, this is my first full Ironman. I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> wow. Anyway. I, yeah. Go on. So I do, these, I do these crazy things. Well, I do these crazy things. And then after completing uh, Hawaii Kona, um, you know, I ran with a running group here in South Africa. They're called the Squirrel Nut Zippers. A little bit of a bizarre name, but uh, there's some amazing athletes in this running group. And one of them came to me and said to me, look, you know, they've got a friend that's uh, quite keen to participate in the, the ice challenge. I was like, what's that? And they were like, no, it's called Beyond the Ultimate. It's a series. And one of them is the, the ice challenge in Lapland, in Swedish Lapland. I said, look, you know what? Give me some time to think about it. I need to investigate and I'll get back to you. It took me three months. Three months later, I phoned Nick, the new in Stevens back and I said, okay, I'm in. I'm going to do it. And he was like, are you being serious? I said, I'm being serious. Let's do it. So the two of us had committed. Um, and then I proceeded to slowly get some more of my um, South African running friends uh, um, interested. We um, we went for a morning run and I ordered a bottle of champagne after the morning run. <laughs> and we were drinking copious amounts of, uh, of bubbly. So we ended up drinking about all five bottles of bubbly and this is nine o'clock in the morning i know um <laughs> brilliant so i ended up roping in another two of my running friends so paul uh, fenter and andre um erasmus and they committed they right there and then entered and paid the first entry fee to the ice ultra so and that was the that was the beginning of uh, of beyond the ultimate ice ultra. That's how we all got ourselves uh, into it. <laughs> now, I've I've had a few conversations with runners over the years where they've talked about alcohol maybe being complicit in them making a decision to enter this race, or or yeah. possibly plying a friend with a with a pint or two to do it. This. This feels premeditated. You came in at 9 a.m. with four or five bottles of, uh, bottles of bubbly and you managed to get them to sign up for the Ice Ultra. Well done. I mean, <laughs> I'll put in a good word with the race directors because that, that's some great recruitment techniques you've shown there. You should definitely be on the books. Fantastic. Yeah, look, we don't, we don't do it very often. Um, you know, obviously it does interfere with the training, but it does help. Um, I'll speak to Chris King about it. That's how we can get a little bit, uh, we can get more participants involved. <laughs> Brilliant. Yep. I'm sure he'll be happy with that. Um, it's so, why the ice ultra? I mean, it's, I guess somebody else brought you the idea, but what, 
what attracted you to that race specifically? So, and that's why it took me three months to make a decision. Um, mm. I was quite keen to do something extraordinary, something completely unknown. And, um, and I was super interested to know how my body was going to react in those conditions. Um, and I think it really, had, I wanted to test myself and see how I would, uh, how I do in, in something that, you know, that involves snowshoes, three, four layers of clothes. I mean, running with 8.5 kgs on your back. Um, and in the snow, minus 25, 30 degrees. So, you know, I am a bit of a sucker for punishments. So I, I was extremely interested and, and that's what excited me about the race. And that's why we chose the, that's why we, we signed up. Basically, brilliant. I love that. You you signed up because it was out of your element, because it was something new and different, and and sounded difficult to do. That's yeah. That's absolutely fantastic. I'm I'm always here for that kind of attitude to these adventures. Um, and so I'm gonna shift us forward in time a little bit then, and actually take us into Swedish Lapland now. Yeah. But had you had, had you had any reason to be in that part of the world before? Had you had you seen seen the arctic previously brilliant yeah, then yeah. what were your first impressions what was it like when you arrived there so we landed in uh in lulia i think that's how you pronounce it um and my first uh my first comment was oh wow we've got to run in this weather we, we're gonna run in this cold weather i was like uh, and i actually i was i was instantly nervous because it was freezing cold it was another level. Nothing I have ever experienced in my life. Um, so arriving there, I got a million butterflies and I thought to myself, geez, I hope I actually survive this. I hope I finish it. Um, conditions were, like I said, something we never experienced, but the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful places I have ever been to. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but I'd have to agree with you there. It is yeah. just a stunningly, stunningly beautiful place, as as difficult as it is to um to get around in. Um and I can understand that feeling. It's um it just seems ridiculous. You you might have seen that kind of terrain on wildlife documentaries, but you don't stick on your running shorts and head out into the hills while it's like that. And no. here you are all of a sudden. Yeah. How were you able to prepare i mean training in snowshoes or training in snow how how practical was that back in south africa uh, so so difficult well i mean take the the freezing cold out of the, the equation you know i bought my my snowshoes from an ex participant um she actually competed in the in the ice challenge the year before and um to be honest i ran in my snowshoes once she mm. told me she only wore her snowshoes 25% of the time. So I was like, you know what? I just need to focus on my fitness and it'll be fine. Um, I ran on beach sand, thick, thick beach sand for 10, 15 kilometers. And I only did it on one day. And, um, and I arrived in Swedish Lapland and I had to wing it. And I ended up running in my snowshoes 90% of the time. So that on its own was a complete challenge. I mean, putting them on, putting them off, and also your running style changes. So you definitely have to run in snowshoes a lot more if you're going to be participating in an event like this. I hear you. I mean, even just coming from the UK, I did this I did this race as a participant in 2017, and the best I could do was running up and down the beach a bit in my snowshoes, yeah. and it's just not the same thing. Um but well done for being willing to head out there on the beach in snowshoes and brave those yeah. looks for the sake of training. At least you had had some preparation in there. And it yeah. is, it's drastically different year to year. The year I did it, I barely took my snowshoes off either. The year after, they barely put them on. You, yeah. you just never know what you're going to get. You have no idea. So knowing that, you know, you're going into an environment here where you've you've more commonly done sort of single day races you've you've definitely more commonly been in much warmer environments while you're doing these races let's put you on the start line then how was that first day 
Because that that's a steep learning curve for anybody. Well, I think uh, to start off with the fact that we were put into TP tents the night before, yeah. and we we were we were told that we needed to sleep in a TP tent on the snow on a little thin reindeer skin was not a good start for the race because it was the longest night of my life. The the, the I thought the tent was going to blow away. The wind was howling. Um, I'm sleeping in the small tent with five of my running friends. Um, it, it was so cold. I, I cannot tell you how cold I was that night that I think I had an hour's sleep. So waking up the next morning, you know, when your eyes feel scratchy and you can feel like, oh, I haven't really had much sleep. And then knowing that I've got to go and run 50 kilometers um, with, let me remind you, and I mean, you would know, well, the first day is a thousand meter elevation gain. So not flat. Yep. It was it was quite it was quite daunting. So standing at the start line with all our layers on, and you're trying to figure out if the layering system is correct. Um, and day one wasn't surprisingly wasn't that cold, but uh, but it was it was quite it was quite scary because all I wanted to do was get to the first checkpoint, and I knew once I'd got to that first checkpoint. I'd start getting into the into the race, but uh, the the nerves at the start line, you feel quite panicky, constantly fidgeting because there's there's just so much on you. It's gloves, it's bats, it's snow goggles, it's you know you you're looking at everybody and you can see everyone's you know a bit panicky. So day one is extremely nerve wracking um, until you start, and then once you start. Um, and you get to that first checkpoint, you are into it. After the first checkpoint, that's where you do your first frozen lake crossing as well, as I remember. You run out from Kevdats. Yeah, how did you find that? Because the, the first time I was running on ice, there, it didn't matter how many times I told myself it was fine and the snowmobiles crossed this and everything's going to be okay. It was still really nerve-wracking. Yeah, look, I, you know, the first 10 kilometers was a bit deceiving because it was on a ice road. So, you know, you're running, it's your first day, and you're thinking, oh, and they tell us to bring snowshoes, uh, you know, and you, you're running at a pretty decent pace. And then you do, you cross that, uh, that river crossing, you get to your first checkpoint, and then things start uh, turning uh, quite a bit. So, you know, I ran with uh, my, my good friend, Andre Erasmus, and we got to about 28 Ks, and we were actually falling through the snow. So you almost disappear. Your one leg disappears into the snow, and your other leg's still on the ground. And, you know, you eventually like, okay, maybe it's time to put our snowshoes on. So, you know, you stop, you put your snowshoes on, and then sort of off you go again. But uh, but the first 10, 12 kilometers is definitely deceiving. It's You, you think, okay, this is the run. It's it's not the run. It's not the race. <laughs> that's just the start. <laughs> no, that's just Chris easing you in gently. Um, <laughs> yeah, things definitely get tougher from there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, getting into that first stage a little bit more, um, you cross that frozen lake. Then there's really quite a grind of a climb in soft snow. And then you're up on exposed plateaus for a big chunk of the day before another big climb at the end. It, it, it only gets tougher as you go along. So how how was your experience of stage one and how were you when you got to the cabins at the end of that stage? Yeah. So stage one for me was a good a good day. Um, you know, I'm I'm a strong mountain runner, mountain climber. So the hillier it is, you know, the the more difficult the climbs, the the better I am as a runner. Um, you know, I actually, I actually really enjoyed day one. Also, day one, you're strong. You know, you've got lots of energy. You know, you haven't really exerted yourself. You know, you haven't run a marathon before that yet. So, um, but you definitely go through stages. You know, so there's stages of where the weather's good, but then you'll run through pockets of freezing, freezing cold air. So your kit starts to bother you. It's on and off. So day one, what I really struggled with was I was actually sweating a lot. Um, I got to a checkpoint where I needed to actually take my base layer and my mid layer off and, and change it with dry clothes because I was sweating so much and we were actually moving quite fast. But, uh, but the actual day for me was beautiful. It was, it was amazing. I loved, I loved the climbing. You know, we were go- going at a good pace. We felt strong. Our nutrition was good. 
Um, and both Andre and I finished really, really strong on day one. But then you finish and you've got your night bag lying at the finish line. And you're like, you know, you're quite tired. You've just run 50 Ks, which is maybe seven, eight hours. You know, and they're like, off you go. You got to go over there. And then, you know, nothing about this race is easy. You got to carry everything yourself. You got to go and find your own water. You've got to cook your own food, light your own fires. Um, you know, you got to make sure you dry your clothes for the next day. There's no coming back and putting your feet up and just relaxing and resting. You know, you, you've got to, you got to work hard before you actually settle for the night. Very, very true. And it, I think it's good that you've drawn that out as well, because I think some people are a little surprised by that when they get there, but you are pretty much self-sufficient throughout. Like there are some of the cabins where you're in, where it's up to you and your teammates to keep that fire lit, or you're going to have an extremely cold night. It's, yeah, you, you don't quite get to switch off. And I've, I've honestly seen athletes out there have their experience almost fall to pieces on them because they forgot to dry a key pair of socks at an inter- yeah. inconvenient time or just lost one of their waterproof socks somehow. Yeah. Like, you you don't get to switch off from your kit admin, right? No, you don't. In actual fact, now that you mention the wet socks, day one, my gaiters weren't working properly and my socks were drenched. They were wet. And I actually, I got to a checkpoint where I needed to take my socks off and change them. And uh, the medic looks at my toes because I, I couldn't feel my toes. They were numb. And he said, mm, I don't think you're going to be leaving this tent and sort of you've got some color back in your toes. You know, so you think everything's okay and you know, it's actually not. So I needed to wait a bit before you know, I, I was let out of the TP tent um, to, to go off again. But uh, it's always, it's kit on, it's kit off, it's wet clothes. You finish, drenched. You, you don't finish dry. It's uh, it, Everything about this race is difficult. Everything. There isn't a single moment that you actually feel 100% comfortable. I, well, you know, I think Chris King would be happy to hear you say that. That was kind of what he had in mind. Um, I've never known a race director who isn't at least a little bit of a sadist. Um, and I, I'm sorry you ended up on the wrong side of that, but... Well done. What, what what that says again is not just that what you did here was a great physical performance, but you had to adapt to a whole set of new rules with your kit management and everything, and you managed to do that on the fly as well, which is which is excellent. I mean, what yeah. what do you put that down to? Because I've watched I've watched disorganized athletes flounder in that environment, and it, there's there's no way of just muddling your way through it. Without a without multi day experience to fall back on, what do you put your success down to there? So, well, it took a year. It really did. It took a year to figure out the the layering system. Hours, hours, and hours on the net, looking at thickness of base layers, looking at thickness of uh, mid layers, looking at different jackets, trying to reach out to past participants. It's it's not an overnight exercise and. You know, we had a, a BTU group with all the participants on it, and I was seeing messages from some athletes two weeks before the event, and they were asking about race kits and bags, and I almost fell off my chair because I'd been planning for this for nine, ten, eleven months. You know, you can't mess around with your kits. If you get your kit wrong, that's your race done, done, over. So it's, it's, you know, you, and we don't have access to that clothing in South Africa. So it was all online purchased from all over the world. I'm sitting with clothes that I'm never going to wear because I received the, the letters and the pants and the socks that I just knew weren't going to be, suffi- weren't going to be suffice. But, uh, bottom line is if your kit is not right, you are, you, you're not going to have a good race. In fact, you'll be lucky to finish it. Absolutely. It, it, yeah. it won't matter. It won't matter how physically fit you are if you haven't done this research beforehand. And there you go. It, there will be people listening to this because they're thinking of doing the Ice Ultra next time yeah. or, or a similar cold adventure somewhere in the world. And if you take yeah. one thing from this interview, take that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. A lot of your success in this race is is stuff that you did way before you turn up there. And, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well done. Well done for doing your homework. Yeah. Thank you. 
So, I mean, as always, it's easy with this uh, with this sport and with these type of races to focus in on the difficult stuff. We all know that it's hard, um, and yeah. it is. But um, what was good? Because I, I, you must have enjoyed being in that environment for the first time and and really not just seeing the arctic or or experience it as a tourist but being in it on foot up close and personal i mean how was that experience amazing when you are there you don't actually realize how fortunate you are now that i am back home i've still got arctic mountain and landscape in my mind um, you know, coming from South Africa, we have the bush. So you would know it as safari where you're going into the middle of nowhere to go and spot the big five. And you think that is silence? No. Swedish Lapland is the most silence place I've ever been to in my entire life. There isn't an insect. I never saw a bird. You know, we were lucky enough to, to see two reindeers on the mountain range, but the silence is another level. So... <sighs> I would love to go back there. I mean, you know, maybe go and stay in the ice hotel and take a a, a sled instead of run. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is absolutely exquisite. And if I had realized then, like what I know now, I think I would have appreciated it a bit more. Well, I mean, I'm glad you got to appreciate it at least. And yeah. you really reminded me of something there. I think I I forget what impact that had the first time I experienced it is that absolute pin drop silence. Uh, any sound that could possibly be there is absorbed by all that snow around you anyway. There is just, as soon as you stop and you're no longer hearing that crunch, crunch, crunch of your snowshoes, there's just nothing. Yeah. No, it's uh, lovely. Uh, it's lovely. Any particular favourite parts of the course? Um... You know, day two, for me, funny enough, running and walking up Mount Kablo, we got to the top and I actually stopped my running partner and I said to him, so so we all actually went there with nicknames, by the way, and his nickname was Sputpus and mine was Langpus. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to explain it to you. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, hey, yeah, anyone who is listening to this, I will leave you to go off and Google that and uh, figure out the Afrikaans. But um, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But spurt, spurt is fast and lung is long. The puss part, I will, uh, I'll leave everybody else to go and uh, figure out for itself. But we Fair start at, we stopped at the top of Mount Kabla and there wasn't a single participant around. In fact, we barely for five days saw anybody. And we took in this most exquisite view at the top of the mountain. And for me, that was my absolute favorite. And then again, running down the back end of Mount Kabla, because you're on top of this massive mountain. Again, day two, you've got a thousand meter elevation gain. The wind was howling. It got to about minus 36 degrees. And uh, but for not for a single moment did we were we unhappy. It was it was cold, but the beauty of that mountain range and the snow and just and running down the other side towards the the forest for me was the best part of the race. Amazing, I guess you can add in there the satisfaction of the fact that you climbed up there yourself. You know, you might get up there on a dog sled team as a tourist, maybe if you're lucky, but you, you got yourself to the top of that mountain. Brilliant. Okay. I, how I, I, I'm going to ask this because it was a big thing for me. I think the hardest part of the race when I did it was day three, was those endless frozen lakes. And it, yes. it, that felt like a conveyor belt for me or uh, just being on a treadmill in the snow. But, um, so firstly... Did you do better than I did on the lakes? Because I thought I was going to lose my mind. Uh, yeah. And secondly, <laughs> what what was the toughest part of the race for you, if not that? So, do you know, the funny thing is, is Chris and the, the BTU team kept on saying to us, if you can get through the first two days, you can finish the race. 
And I think that messed with all of our minds because I still said to you, my very good friend, Paul Fenter, that was a little bit sort of at the back of the pack and, and he walked quite a bit, but he, he had an amazing time out there. He said to me, in fact, I said to him, you've done the first two days, Paul, you're a for away. Oh my word, was I wrong. Okay. We started day three and it was just kilometers and kilometers of lakes, not a single climb. And it was an experience that I've never experienced before. On top of that, we had a blizzard and a whiteout hit us. So we had very little visibility. And my friend Andre that I was running with has never experienced snow to that level. He's never been on a ski holiday. He actually got quite disorientated and it was the funniest thing. I actually found myself laughing like a kid, like three or, like three or four times over. He was running in front of me and he would suddenly out of nowhere start running to the left. And I would have to call him and say, where are you going? What are you doing? He's getting tired and he would end up in slow to his, uh, to his knees. He would lift up his goggles and he would look at me and go, I can't see. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> and I was, I was in hysterics. It was absolutely hilarious. But, um, I had a little, a little clear opening on my goggle because my goggles were completely misted up. That's another thing is you can't keep your goggles clear. And I fortunately had a little clear spot in my goggle and I was running and I was, I was trying to sort of see where we were going and he was behind me. But I found day three extremely hard. And um, I really thought that day two was going to be tough. And I was surprised because day two, I felt good. But at the end of day three, we were running four poles. We were walking a pole. We were running four poles. We were walking a pole. By the time we got to the end of day three of running legs for how many kilometers was it? 42 kilometers. Uh, I thought I was going to lose my mind. Uh, it, it was, and we, it, it, it just, it's, it's like trying to explain to somebody what it's like going to space. You cannot describe what it is like to run on snow on legs for 42 kilometers. It is so hard. It is. And thank you for making me feel better about how tough I found that day. Um, although I have to say, it, I had a view, at least. Um, you had whiteout conditions, and that just must have been so much tougher. It is psychologically, you you now don't have any points of reference to tell you how far you've gone or how much further you've got no. to go. And that, that really takes some, some digging deep to find the motivation to keep it going. It does. It really does. Which I guess leads me on to a question that, that often comes up in these things. What is your motivation in those moments? Because we we get used to it. The kind uh, the kind of people who will just go off to the Arctic and, and go and do a race out there, the kind of people I bump into on these events, you, you lose your sort of normal frame of reference for it. And uh, most people out there who haven't done that sort of thing will think you're crazy uh, for having done this in the first place. How It would be unimaginable that you were able to do this. So how do you do it? Where, where do you go at those really tough times? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because I've had that question a lot. But, you know, I've got, I've got quite a hectic job. Um, so I'm a managing director of a big uh, company here in South Africa. And I don't really have the space and the time to to digest um, and think about out, stuff outside of sort of family and and work. Um, so I guess you know for me, it, I think about my childhood. Um, you know, I think about um, you know stuff, big things that have happened in my life, and and uh, how I felt at that point in time. But it really just takes me back to events that I, I haven't quite digested um, and that I need to think through and think over again. And I take that time, uh, it sounds crazy, you know, while I'm punishing myself, to, to, to really think through life and, and events and future. And it's lovely. I love it. It's, it's where I have the space to, to clear my mind. It's amazing. Wow. I mean, that's fantastic. 
I guess it, it, when I was, you know, wondering there how you get through those tougher moments is I, it, for some people, I think what they struggle with is the ability to take themselves out of that moment they're in where they are just having this very difficult time and experiencing emotional and physical discomfort. And it, it sounds like that wasn't such so much an issue for you. You know, you, you could take your mind out of where you were a little bit. Well, uh, let's get to day four. We'll have a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's get to day four. No, so day, day four, the wheels came off for me uh, from, I think, from all aspects. But, you know, you've got to have one bad day, right? You can't have all days that uh, that have worked out for you. No, day four, I found extremely difficult. Uh, 64 kilometers, Um you know, I'd formed a massive blister on my my left foot from the snow shoe, and the snow the snow shoes were starting to uh, put pressure on the top of my foot. Um, and you know, I think oh, yeah, I started I started started day four with you know my stomach wasn't feeling great because you know you got to remember you're eating dried dehydrated food every night. You know, you're not eating good nutrition. Um, you're drinking um, electrolytes. And so, you know, things just, your body just starts going, you know, what's going on here? Um, so my, my stomach wasn't feeling great. I ran the first sort of 15 Ks and I just didn't feel myself. Um, and we got to about 20 Ks and then my running partner and I decided to actually walk fast to the march because your body gets to a point where it goes, I can't run anymore. Um, and that was a 20 Ks and we needed to do 64 kilometers that day. So we pretty much fast packed and slow ran the, the rest of the day. But, um, I got to 40 kilometers and I ran out of nutrition. I had no, I had no more food left. None I, at all. Uh, I planned badly for day four. I, I didn't pack enough. Food. I, I, I'd eaten everything, so I didn't have sufficient for sixty-four k's. And I thought, because I'm not a very big eater when I, when I run, um, but it got it got really cold on day four. Um, the last twenty k's of the race, it snowed heavily. Um, the conditions were tough, um, so I think I was really just eating a lot more quickly um, than anticipated to keep my body warm. And I got to 40 Ks and I had one sachet of hammer perpetuum list. And, and I knew that was going to last me another hour and a half, maybe two hours from an energy point of view. Mm. And I got to, I got to 50 kilometers and I started feeling dizzy. Um, I, I, I could feel I was becoming hyperglycemic. It was, it was getting dark. It's snowing hard. And I said to Andre, I said, Andre, I said, I'm running into problems. Um, I was like, do you have any food? I, I, I need to eat something. So he handed me some dried fruit, but he himself didn't have a lot of food left either. Anyway, I managed to get to 55 kilometers. Um, that would leave us with seven kilometers to finish. And um, again, I was cold because I was hyperglycemic. And I made the biggest error of not putting on my puffer jacket when I was cold. Uh, um, so by the time I'd got to the TP tent, my body was so cold. So much so that I actually was trying to hide my shivering from the medics. And uh, I put, I put my, I put my puffer jacket on and, um, Andre had given me another little packet of dried fruit and he had a, a piece of uh, dry horse. So it's boltong in South Africa. Yeah. It's dried meat. And I had a piece of that, and that that was it. That was all the nutrition. We had nothing left. And uh, I looked at him. He looked at me, and he said to me, Taro, we've got seven kilometers left. And I said, Andre, yes, let's go. And off we went, and not even a K out of the TP tent. I was so cold. I was trying to open up my little sachet where, with my hand warmers that I kept on dropping it. I couldn't put my headlamp onto my head. I kept on putting it over my over my uh, windbreaker. He was stopping. He was taking my windbreaker off, trying to put my my um, headlamp on for me. Um, and 
if I think about it now, I might have actually been a little bit hyperthermic um, because I couldn't think straight. I, cu- I couldn't do the simplest things on my own, which is, which is quite scary. Mm-hmm. We got to one and a half kilometers before the finish. I saw the light and we had to cross the lake. It was eight o'clock in the evening. It was pitch black. It was about minus 30 degrees. It was snowing hard. And I said to Andre, I don't know how I'm going to get there. He said to me, Taryn, it's one kilometer. I said, I'm so tired. I am so cold. I don't know how I'm going to get there. And obviously, you know, you have to. You've got to find it somewhere. I found it somewhere. But when I got when I got to the lodge at the end of day four, I actually almost wanted to burst out into tears. It was such an incredibly hard day. It was so tough. So, so tough. Again, if it's any comfort, it took me nearly 45 minutes to cross that last lake. Uh, I was in pieces too. <laughs> And, you know, you were almost in tears by the end of that day. I cried at the start line. Uh, it's so, you know, could be worse. Uh, no, it is. Oh it's a grind. It's an incredibly, incredibly tough day. And it catches yeah. you just at the point where you are at your most calorie and sleep deprived, which and you're in these incredibly cold temperatures. So your body's burning through fuel faster than you've experienced before. Yeah. That's yeah. a really hard place to be. Um so hard. You know, but you did hardest, that. hardest day of my life hardest day of my life it was it was so tough it was and that makes you look back and really appreciate what you actually are capable of because if you put your mind to it you can do it there is a little bit more there but uh but toughest day of my life extremely hard well one of the things that i was going to ask you about was you know it, what is it that you get out of these experiences but i think you've you've just touched on it there maybe that you did do that and you will always know that when your back's against the wall when you are that exhausted and depleted you can still drag yourself through and mm-hmm. do, would you say that kind of experience is what motivates you to do these things or you know mm-hmm. and if not what is mm-hmm. You know, it's the self accomplishment. It's the, the the feeling of knowing what your body can physically do, what your mind is physic- physically capable capable of, um, and and the feeling afterwards is just the best feeling in the world, knowing that you've completed such a such a major hectic event. Um, for me, that that is the best feeling in the world. And then, of course, doing it with a bunch of friends and watching them cross the finish line. And finishing together as a group, I mean, there's nothing better. And honestly, there's nothing better. But you have to be, I think, uh, I think you have to be a little bit crazy. Yes, there you, you, I don't think you're going to be quite normal to do these <laughs> these five day crazy stage races. Well, I wouldn't dream of making those kind of accusations, Taryn. <laughs> but um, you know, you've 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 brought that up yourself. Uh, <laughs> so we've we've sort of talked there about crossing that line together i think we've just taken ourselves into the final day firstly on paper 15 kilometers three park runs that that feels like it's going to be easy when you're going into the uh, yeah. race doesn't it but yeah. how was it actually you know the way i'd finished day four um I, I literally i walked up the stairs i got i was so cold i put my down jacket on i got changed in my sleeping bag i was so exhausted i couldn't even take myself to the bathroom um, I lay in my sleeping bag for two hours um, to try and defrost. And, you know, I needed to get nutrition into my body. I eventually managed to do that. And I and I lay there the night before day five thinking, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do day five the way I'm feeling right now. 15 kilometers feels like 50 kilometers. Um, but funny enough, I woke up on day five and I felt amazing. Oh, brilliant. I felt, I felt great. I don't know what happened. I mean, besides the blisters on my feet from the snowshoes, um, you know, maybe it was because in my head I knew it was only 15 kilometers and I knew it was almost over. But I think what the big sort of the big positive game changer was on day five is that the sun came out and it wasn't a gloomy, 
day of running, you know what I mean? And the sun came out and I think everyone, the, the strength of the pack was amazing. There wasn't a single negative person. Um, that, that, that actually completed this race this year. Everybody was extremely focused, very positive. Um, and the vibe was amazing. And, and I'm, I'm saying that because it's important because when you've got negative people that are a little bit sort of hesitant and not sure, it does actually impact everybody else. And we all stood at the start of day five in in great spirits. And there was this big debate of, should we wear snowshoes? Should we not wear snowshoes? No, nah, let's can snowshoes. Let's put the snowshoes on the, on the, on our bags. And, you know, like it was just, it was wonderful. And sure, we started and, you know, the 15 case felt did feel almost longer. I'm not going to lie, but, but it was great to only run 15 Ks. I must be honest. And then when we got to that red carpet and we crossed the finish line, that beer was the best beer of my life. <laughs> I was so happy to be holding a Colesberg in my hand. Um, yeah, and uh, it was that was amazing. Day five was also it was a good day for us. So that moment then, when you finally crossed the line, a year of research and having to learn the thicknesses of all these base layers and do all of that figuring out all the training that goes into it. You've battled through this environment that you'd never seen before and and never felt before. Had that really tough fourth day. Like, how did it feel crossing that line? What what, what were those emotions? Oh, it was it was the best feeling crossing that line. A feeling of wanting to cry, wanting to laugh, not hundred percent sure what what to actually feel because. You, you know, also you haven't seen people and you haven't heard noise for so long. So as you're making your way back to Yokmok, it feels, it feels strange. I mean, I can't explain the feeling when you see people again and you hear snowmobiles and, and when I smelt burgers being cooked in the, the teepee tent, I was like, it felt, it felt very foreign. It felt strange, but. The sensation of crossing that line is what makes the race worth it. It's the best feeling. I could have cried. I didn't. I chose to smile. <laughs> but uh, it's amazing. It's really, it, it makes it all worth it. Amazing. Amazing. Well, well done. I mean, you deserved every ounce of joy and whatever else was muddled in there that you experienced when you crossed that line. Sort of congratulations once again like Thank what you, you did out there was brilliant and having had this conversation with you and her put it in context i just yeah. even more impressive like that that's an incredibly tough thing that you did out there yeah, um it is. so i mean before we sign off regularly i i'll sort of ask my guests to leave us with one last nugget of wisdom because there will be people listening to this thinking how on earth am I going to take on this challenge myself or or some similar massive event out there that that they've got ahead of them if there's a sort of one bit of advice you you would give to those people what what did you learn out there that would help them don't underestimate it go prepared um don't don't be overly confident because I was extremely nervous and scared for this event um, and I'm happy I was because it was way more brutal that I, than I even imagined. So I think one word of advice for me is take it seriously. Plan, take 12 months and spend time on your kit. Nutrition is your, is your key discipline. If you don't have the right nutrition, you know, you are carrying everything on your back. Um, so you try and skimp. Here and there, don't. It's not worth it. I ran out of food on day four. It's not worth it. Carry that extra 500 grams, you know, wear the right clothes. But most importantly, go in with the right mindset because if your mind is not prepared for what you're about to to enter, you are going to be horribly surprised. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Words of caution there to leave you with, but it's, it is sound advice. Part of the journey is the research and part of what you're doing out there, a big yeah. part. 
is about right. mental okay. resilience as as much as it is physical. So yeah, yeah, makes perfect sense. Well, Tara, thank you. That, that was a, well, I really enjoyed that interview. That was that was excellent. Uh, you've been really entertaining, enthusiastic. There's loads people can take out of that for their own adventures. So just yeah, yeah. thank you very much from me and from anyone who might be listening. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you, thank you very much for your time, Will. It was great. Awesome. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Good afternoon, then. Alex O'Shea. Alex, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, how are you doing? Thawed out from your uh, ice ultra? Yeah, kind of a weaker recovery, but yeah, all good. And, uh, you know, I don't want to skip ahead too far, but I always find myself doing this. I think people are fascinated, especially the people who are listening to this and maybe haven't done something as big themselves and are, are thinking about it. What did you feel like when you got back? What what has that recovery process been like over the last week? Uh, I suppose the first thing everyone says is how much weight did you lose? And when you when you hop on the weighing scales, you're actually heavier because you've torn muscle and your body has this mechanism to protect itself and it retains fluid. So I was retaining at least four liters of fluid plus whatever weight I had lost. So you know, for the next few days, you're you're going to be heavier on the scales. You've no sense of what weight you've actually lost. So it's kind that's, of a, a strange work. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. I don't hear people mention that very much. But yeah, absolutely a fact in it, right? You are you have beaten the hell out of your muscles and your body's got to do something about that over the next few days. So yeah, not what you'd expect. But um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I haven't, nobody's mentioned that to me directly before. And like, a, lot of, this is, a lot of the runners in the group would have mentioned afterwards swollen ankles, swollen feet. Like my yeah. my ankles weren't swollen. So I was obviously containing fluid kind of more evenly over the spread of my body. But some people had pulled a lot in their ankles and feet. Yeah. I mean, that we definitely touch on. Like it, I always see it come up. Whenever somebody in one of the Facebook groups or on online or whatever asks, you know, what shoes should I wear? Almost always the first answer is, whichever they are, get a bigger size. And I'd, if you haven't been in it, I don't think people quite realize how much your feet can balloon over the course of uh, one of these races, even if you are on snow, right? It's not like it's a soft surface once you're out there. Well, yeah. Um. Anyway, thanks for that. That's that's skipping way ahead to, uh, to after your race and I'd, I'd really like to start much further back than that because I'm really interested in hearing about what happened out in the Ice Ultra and how that event went for you. And it, it, it's great for me to be able to talk to you because I wasn't actually there for this one. So I'm going to be learning about this as as we go along as well. But it, you've done some absolutely brilliant stuff before it, which we were talking about a little before I started recording so when did you sort of start down this route into the massive events that that you're out there running now? And I, I believe this hinges around your first marathon. Yeah, so my first marathon, I ran in my fire gear. I'm a fireman. I did it for charity. I was 40 years of age. Um, when I was 15 or 16, I trained for a marathon, Dublin City Marathon or Capital. I applied and they basically sent back the paperwork. I was too young, and I kind of stopped running for years. So ah, it was it wasn't until I was forty that I kind of got back into kind of the idea of saying, right, I'm going to do a marathon. And then I suppose because it took me so long, I made it special. I took on the Guinness World Record, and I ran the marathon in full fire gear, steel toe cap boots, pants, jacket, helmet, and I did it in three forty one ten, and. People instantly said, you know, what could you do without the fire gear or have you thought of running for Ireland at 50k, 100k, 24 hour? I didn't even know those things existed. So that one event started me on this journey. That's absolutely brilliant. And just to give us a bit of background in there, how much did that fire gear weigh approximately? Do, do you know? Um, I did. Um, like... <laughs> It's kind of the first question everyone asked was like, what did it weigh? The minute you start training in it, you don't care what it weighs. It just comes down to steel toe cap boots. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter what weight you've on, your body can carry the weight. 
It's the steel toe cap boots. You're not wearing a pair of runners. They become the whole event. It's all about the boots. Oh, I I can only imagine, and I, I I slightly see through jealousy there. In the, I've I've run two road marathons, and you beat my PB in a, in your fire outfit and with these steel toe cap boots on, um, which just gives some sort of idea of that. Not that I'm like a particularly fast marathon runner, but you were able to top that with all of that gear on. No wonder people were coming to you afterwards, going, "If you thought of doing anything tougher than this, like how?" How? I'm a bit stumped there. Like, you know, what was it the that that you were able to draw on that that made you able to do 26 miles in those steel toe cap boots? Because that that's a huge achievement in a bit in and of itself, and we haven't even got to the bigger stuff yet. Like, I, I suppose some people saw this as kind of a, a bit of a theatrical event. You know, like you look at London Marathon, you see all these people doing all these fantasy things. Um, some people say fire school things for Guinness World Records. I took this very serious. I had 13 months in the planning where I trained. I had a physio that I was going to, I was doing it for charity. So she was helping me out an awful lot. I was doing a lot of runs where I'd run 10 miles, shorts and t-shirt runners. And a minute I finished 10 miles straight into the fire gear and do another 10. So you got the benefit of running on tired legs. So you could damage yourself doing the 20 miles in the fire gear, mm. but you got a benefit by doing the second 10 in it tired. So I think the physio came up with some very clever uh, ways of training to maximize potential and limit injury. That was very shrewd because, I mean, that was one of the limitations I was thinking of is how on earth do you prepare yourself for that without causing an injury? And You'll know what the capacity for this is. I d- I've done the ice ultra and the snowshoes gave me a couple of injuries and they weigh 300 grams and they're not steel toed. So it, it, that makes a lot of sense of this. You you put a lot of prep work into this. I it, it, when you When you went into it, are you the kind of, did you go into this with a sort of certainty that you were going to be able to do what you did? Because that is an extremely hard thing that you managed to do. Yeah, by the, by the time I got to the start line of that event, I was starting fairly confident that if things didn't go wrong, in the sense if I didn't pick up a silly injury, I was definitely capable of breaking the record. And I was going out to run my best, not just shade a minute or two off. So wherever that took me. So I kind of... I didn't really play it safe. I was kind of giving it up, giving it my all because it was my first marathon. and I wanted to see what I wanted to do. I wanted to push myself. It wasn't just about making a record. I mean, that's excellent. And I'm, I'm already hearing in there the kind of thing that will have driven people around you be saying, you, you could run further. There's more here. And you, you did a lot more, right? I, I, I've also, we were talking about before this, you were going to run the 32 counties across Ireland, so 32 marathons in 16 days. And was that for charity as well? Yeah, that was for the Irish Guide Dogs for Blind. And um, it ended up not quite being 16 days, didn't it? So could you talk us through a little of that? Like, what? How did you get started on that as a project for starters? And then uh, what actually ended up happening when you were out there? I suppose how the, how that event started was there's a, a famous Irish runner, Ian Keat, ultra runner, ah, who would have run yeah. 24 hour. He's done spine. He's won spine several times. You know, tremendous athlete. He yeah. was running Ruth of Ireland, uh, Malin to Mizzen, and I joined him to start off. Um, so I ran out the first 20 or 30 miles with him and we were just having a chat, shooting the breeze, and he was kind of saying, what's next for you? You know, and I mentioned that there was a guy in Ireland had ran a marathon in every county of Ireland, but he did it one a day. So it was very achievable to tie in the charity, the media, the running, say you're going to be in this place at this time. And I said, you know, I can't take 32 days off work. Um, I'd like to do it. And he said, ah, your man wasn't much of a runner. He said, why don't you try to do it in half the time? And that was literally he was on his run from one end of Ireland to the other 
I was just supporting them for a few miles and the seed was planted and I went back and had a look at the map and I was like, is this even logistically possible to drive between every county, you know, to get the head down for a few hours and just logistically could we, could we work it out? And uh, I decided, yeah, that's how uh, we go for it. I love that Ian Keith is somewhere behind this as well. Like he's, he's someone I've interviewed a few times at the Spine Race. Great guy. I can I can hear his voice saying to you, oh. ah, just do it in half the time. Hang on. Yeah. So, I mean, I, without getting too much into it, like what were the logistics of that? Like that's that's got to be a difficult thing to tie together. And it's, I think it's something that if you see a big event like that in, in another sport or with a celebrity involved in it, you know there's been a team behind the scenes putting all that together. It's more often the case with these kind of ultra distant stuff that it's just sort of one person juggling it around their job or or a few people juggling it around their job. What was it like? And it must have been an endurance event in and of itself, just tying all this together. Like it was basically two people. It was me and a guard reached out, so the fireman and the guard. So it was kind of a good media angle. Um, and yeah. well, the guard was Ollie O'Sullivan from Kerry. And basically we rocked up day one. We did a real marathon down in Kerry and Dingle. We drove the afternoon to the next county and we basically ran a bit of a greenway into a park and we did loops in the park because I was afraid if I was running from A to B on a road and too many people joined me, suddenly I became a big event and uh-huh. I could shut down because these people's safety then became my problem. So I had to go to lots of parks and get permission from local councils to run in their parks and have mini events. Um, I didn't know whether one person would turn up or whether 20 people would turn up. Um, but basically, I had to cover all eventualities for insurance. So there was lots of paperwork for every single event. Um, I bet I've had a little bit of a window into what it takes to put together races and events and stuff like that that are in one location. You you were doing two marathons a day and having to get those permissions and do that planning over and over again. That That must have been a lot to deal with. It was, but it's like anything. Once you kind of start and you're determined, things fall into place and you make it happen. On the looking at it before it's happened, it just seems a bit daunting. But once you start down the rabbit hole, you just have to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. And, I, I, you know, that's a sentiment I hear from a lot of people doing these kind of big endurance feats. A, you, you just have to start on it. And you you learn as you go along and you pick it off in bite-sized chunks and, and you get there, just like picking off a kilometer at a time while you're doing these races. But I, I, that's amazing. And you ended up, for various reasons, coming in under the 16 days that you aimed for, right? Yeah, the, the whole thing was we wanted to, because it was for charity, we needed the media to be at the finish line. And we had arranged for the Lord Mayor um, but basically we were told, okay, if you do 16 days, it means we're going to finish on an evening marathon. And then by the time the press have taken the photos, we have missed the next day's uh, news coverage. They need the photos first thing in the morning to get into the late evening papers. So basically we had to finish of, an or- of a morning marathon. So to do that, we basically had to change mid-event and... The second last day, we did our we did a really early morning marathon at about half five start. We then did a real marathon that started around lunchtime, and we then drove to the next county and we did a minute past midnight. So technically, we went into the next day, and then we were able to do the second marathon of that day. It was like a nine or ten o'clock start in the morning or eleven o'clock or something, um, so that we could get all the media photos done at the start and have the Lord Mayor meet us sometime within that event. Um, so, yeah, we had to kind of think on our feet and kind of reschedule it towards the end. I love that. And, you know, you were doing it for the charity angle, right? So you, you, you've you got to do that. You, you're you going to go for maximum impact. So you changed your plans. You worked with what was in front of you and, and you made it happen, even though it meant having to... Uh, I mean, you can't have got a lot of sleep between those marathons towards the end there. No, no, like that that midnight marathon was definitely my slowest. Um, I can't remember the time of it now, but 
Like there was a lot of walking in that one. That was that was the most horrific one because as well it was a nighttime marathon, so it was it was pitch black with a head torch. Every other mar- every other marathon was daylight. So it wow. added some more. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I, I just think that's a colossal thing that you did. And both of these were for charity, which is which is great. And it, you are now sort of growing these out. You've gone from one marathon, boom. Now we're into thirty-two marathons in in fifteen and a half days, I guess. So your your rise has been pretty vertical. Before I jump into the ice ultra, is is there anything I've missed along the way? Or it, it, because what I've heard so far is quite a lot of sort of road marathon based stuff. Where it, where did we make a more of a transition into ultra running? I've gone to Spartathlon. I've ran hundred k in twenty four hour for Ireland. I went to Lake Pacal yeah. and did the ice marathon there. Um, but it's very different to the Swedish Arctic. I suppose it's the similarity is there's a bit of snow on a lake, um, but it's it's far more in keeping with running a, a road marathon. Like it's a fast event. You're only you're only in a you know an inch or two dusting on top of an lake. Really, you don't have snowshoes. Um, you can you can put in a quick time. Fair enough. So, what led you to the ice ultra in the first place? How did you, how did you end up in Sweden? Um, I somehow came across it a few years ago, and I was like, "Oh yeah, definitely something that I'd like to do." But at the time, I was running for Ireland, either probably twenty four hour, and I think when you when you're running for your country, you get into a bit of a bubble, and you don't look at any of these events because you just can't prioritize the time for them. Like yeah. if you're be running a Europeans or a Worlds, that's your time away from family and work. You can't you can't fit one of these events in. Um so last year on my forty ninth birthday I ran for Ireland at hundred K and my wife had spinal surgery after that and I kinda said to the team manager, I said, Look, I don't think I'll be back at an Irish Fest again. Um I'm super grateful. I've done it five times. I was 49 at the time I said it. I'm now 50 in a few weeks. Um, there's plenty of younger people. I do think if I put the work in, I do think I could kind of claw my way onto the end of the team. But um, that's not where I want to be. Um, you know, if you're going to be on the team, you want to feel that you can contribute at the front of it or that you can feel that you can do PBs. Um the reality is for me to do a PB in a 24 hour event, I'd have to put in colossal work and juggling four kids, full time job. Uh, it's just getting harder and harder. So I'm looking now to these events where I can get, you know, huge satisfaction doing some of these extreme events, I suppose. And I'm going to fill the void of not wearing the Irish shirt. Well, I hope we went some way to fill in that void. Uh, it, it, I'd, I'd love to. You'd seen Baikal, so it's not like it's your first time in this kind of Arctic-like environment, but what were your first impressions when you got out there and, and saw where you were going to be racing? Um, like everyone, I was looking at the weather forecast, you know, daily. I have I had to, like I had the app on the phone and, you know, instead of the local places on the app, I had all the places in Sweden. And uh, basically, was it two weeks before we went, they, they got a record low. Minus yeah. 43 and something. And so I was hoping for a cold one. And then when we flew in over Stockholm, I could see bits of green. I was quite disappointed. But Stockholm is a long way away from where we're racing. It and is. The, fur- the further north we got, um, the colder it got. Um, so I suppose like part of me, if, if it was going to be mild by their standards, I was going to be a bit disappointed. But during the race, we got a bit of everything. Um, the mild weather means we're going to get softer snow underfoot. You're going to lift more snow. It's going to make a harder event to run. Colder yeah. event means more layers. You'll get on top of that, but you'll have a faster running condition. Um, so it's very much a mix. You either you can survive the cold and run faster, or the milder conditions by their standards, which is still cold, you're picking up more snow and going through kind of softer snow and slushier snow and 
as we learned, there's a hundred different types of snow. Um, like in Ireland, you know, the UK, we kind of get one or two types of snow. And, you know, we get a snow day and we build a snowman and we send everyone a photo. And I remember I have a brother living in Austria and I used to always ask his kids, why aren't you sending us pictures of your snowman in the snow? You've loads of snow. And he used to always say, wrong type of snow. And it's because it's that dry snow that doesn't form. And, yeah. you know, you'd be naive to it until you go to somewhere like this. Um, like we encountered snow that was like running through flour. We encountered snow that was like sand drifting over your feet. Um, so we had sticky snow, we had hard snow, we had soft snow. It was just, you know, it was amazing. I, I, you bring in stuff back to me as well because you know it was a long time ago. I ran that one myself, but it, it, that really struck me too that it isn't like the snow that I knew from at home. That that it often is this really dry, powdery stuff. You couldn't make a snowball out of it. It, it billows and blows around, which is where you get your white out conditions in a little bit of wind. It's a totally different experience. And snowshoes are useful. But in stuff that is just like flour, if it's if it's piled up, they're they're only a limited amount of use. It's it is still a tricky tricky bit of trail to run along. Um, and you had a bit of everything, so uh, I'm I'm gonna probably skip ahead a little bit here. But how did you find the snowshoes? Because they're a bit like Marmite. Either either people are like, oh yeah, they were great, I couldn't believe it, or they hate them and never want to wear them again. Yeah, like I think they were both. Like most of us went with the TSL Hyperflex because they're the lightest one you can get on the market. Yeah. And um, they're light because they're designed for racing. They're probably designed for just flat. Um, other ones may have had an advantage on the uphill sections, even though they're heavier. The buckles I absolutely hated for something that seemed to be so cleverly engineered to be light and minimalistic. I just thought there must be a better system than this plastic buckle that froze. And that was very, very difficult to close or open. So when you put them on, you didn't want to take them off um, for that reason. Um, and so there was times I think I put them on too late. And there was possibly times where I could have come out of them for a while, which I didn't. I just ran through. And then you come into soft snow again and you'd say, ah, sure, maybe it was better off I didn't take them off. So it's, it's a very personal thing. People have to make that decision for themselves when to get into them, when to get out of them. Um, yeah, like if, if you can get practice in them in snow, it's, it's a huge advantage. I didn't. Ah, well, that was going to be my next question. I, I was never able to go out on them in snow before the race either. I didn't, the best, the closest I got was running a, running a few miles on the beach, like, but sand doesn't quite stand up, but it was, it was the closest thing I could get, but you hadn't been able to run on snow in yours either. No, I took them to the beach as well. And, um, I ran in sand dunes. I took them to the edge and I went, ran up and down the sand dunes, which I felt would be a tougher test. And then I brought them down to the shoreline where the water was lapping in. So it was the very soft and you were sinking. Um, so I tried to give a combination of everything. I had my gloves on. I had two layers of gloves on. I had the backpack on to simulate the weight. Um, I felt they weren't, they were, they were okay. Um, I felt I was able to get in and out of them quite quick, but I, you know, this was on a beach. It was warm. My hands were in gloves, so they were warmer again. Suddenly, when you go to the Arctic and your hands are, you know, cold, you just don't have that feeling and that dexterity. So again, the buckles, this this just plastic buckle just drove me mad. Yeah, I did, there were a couple of times that the uh, Sammy team had to pour like boiling water onto my buckles to melt them enough for us to be able to get them undone. Otherwise, I'd ne- I'd still be wearing them now. Um, always, always difficult, but. It, yeah, it's a personal journey, isn't it? And I think it's like that with a lot of the kit. And part of what I'm sure will have been a journey for you is that transition from maybe running in more road or road-like environments to suddenly having this big kit list of stuff you need for the Arctic in front of you. I mean, how did you find that process? Some people love that research element of it and others others really don't. I suppose at the start when you see the mandatory kit, I was expecting more okay, if there's a jacket, I was expecting that this is the minimum requirement, this is kind of the maximum. I kind of thought I'd get a lot more detail and breakdown of equipment needed. But after coming back, I realized, look, it's a very personal thing. 
what suited me at one end of the race was certainly not going to be the product you need if you're going to be going out there and be at the back of the race. Um, and even what I brought, I had multiple layers that I didn't use in case I went over on an ankle and suddenly I went from being up the front generating a lot of heat to being far more stationary and having to wrap up far more. So it's very, it's very much a personal journey on the kit and it's very much, as you said, something you have to really search. But it's not like saying, okay, I'm going snowboarding and you look up snowboarding and you see the kit that's available for snowboarding. There is no, there is no company making kit for this event. So you're borrowing from mountaineering, you're borrowing from downhill skiing, snowboarding, wherever you think you can draw some bit of a resource from, you're basically trying to pull these things together to make the best possible um, package for you. Yeah, and it, I'm glad you saw it in that way. It is, it's a, it's a massive part of doing one of these events is that journey and it is it's individual to everybody as you say the kit that works for you is not going to work for somebody who's more towards the back of the pack and the only way you can find that out is by trying out the kit and getting out there in it as often as possible um yeah one um one big tip that i'd say um like if you get a mountaineering pants or a mountaineering jacket you see a lot of them they have these little loops so they have like a a bit of cord tied on the zip so I basically replicated that. I got another, I got a, a roll of like four mil pink um, rope and I basically extended every loop on my jacket. So like under my armpit, there was a zip. So if you got hot, you could vent your jacket down to your hip. I was able to do all this in two pairs of gloves because I extended every loop. And because they were bright pink, I could see them. I could just tilt my head and tilt my body and the loop would appear. So I don't know how I came up with it. I think one day I just saw the little loops that were on the clothing and I said, you know, if I extend these, um, but it definitely worked. It definitely had a huge advantage. If anyone is listening to this, that is gold. That's really, really good. That's something I've seen like a couple of the guys on the safety team at the Arctic Spine do, and it, it makes perfect sense, right? You now don't have to stop, take off those two layers of gloves, potentially get your hands very cold while you're faffing about looking for these things. You you are now able to function on the move. So that that is a great tip. I love that. Now, that doesn't, you know... That's that's great. We've got into the kit, and I'm sure we could spend an hour just picking that apart. But I'd I'd like to hear a bit more about your experience because you you did so well out there. Were you expecting to be right at the front of the pack? Were you expecting to come out of this event with with a win? Um, no. Like you know, I think it'd be very arrogant to say you're going over to win any race. Like I was going over to push myself. Wherever that put me in the race, that that was going to be wherever it put me. If it put me up the front, I'd try to be a contender. If I was in the middle, I was going to push myself to catch the fella in front of me, um, or female, um, whichever way it fell. Um, so no, I, I didn't. I most certainly didn't go over to win. Uh, you never know the caliber of people that are going to turn up. Um, I didn't really look at the names. Like you know, it's a multinational. People from all over the world, you're not going to know these people. Um, and then when you do turn up, you see people and their kit bags and they have like badges from Martin de Sabla and different things. So you have a lot of, you have a lot of quite experienced athletes. Um, you have a few athletes that are taking on something for the first time. Um, but they caught, they've come from different backgrounds. It might have been rowing or different challenges. Um, so they've similar mindset. So you certainly don't know, um, like when you look around the room, you certainly don't know who's in it. Yeah. I, I remember again, you're sort of triggering memories in me. It's, uh, it is a lot to take in when you first get to an event like this and you realize there are people around you who this might be their 10th, 11th, 12th of, event of this type. And it's kind of intimidating to uh, see all those MDS badges and everything on their kit when you get in there. Um, it, it, does stuff like that bother you? Do you do you feel the pressure when you go into these events? Um, no, 
Um, like when I saw the MDS badges, I was trying to look around to see what other ones I could see because I knew what MDS was. So if I saw, like I remember seeing um, all the Everest Marathon, somebody had a badge and logo from that. And I was thinking, oh, that's one I'd like to do someday. So I was then kind of window shopping, um, looking for events. Brilliant. So no, Brilliant. It's, it's not pressure. Like these things are, these things are to be enjoyed. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you see it that way, which brings me to the question, I suppose. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, but I was I was very fortunate because the way my event played out, I was able to race really hard, uh, put a bit of a lead in, and then I was able to share the experience and run with someone. Um, so like, was it day three or four? Day four and five, um, myself and George, so like on the long day, I looked behind at one stage. Um, I was only, we were only a few K out and George was nearly on my shoulder. So I was like, there is absolutely no point me running 65K grinding this out on my own when I could share the experience with someone. So I just drifted back. Me and George sat in together. There was no, there was no arrangement. There was no pact. We just had a chat. You know, if he wanted to go at any stage and race me out, that wasn't a problem if I wanted to go at any stage. And then when we got near the end, we had a little chat and I said, you know what? If you want to go ahead and take a stage win, I'm not bothered. And uh, he said, no, he said, we've we've done 60 odd K together. He said, we'll cross the line together. And we did, we crossed the line all the hands. And um, it was far nicer to have that in the race and that shared experience than to run it as a solo competitor and say that you finished 10 minutes ahead of him. 20 minutes ahead of him, you know, yeah. to share the memories was was nice. Oh, that's fantastic. And I, I love those kind of stories that come out of these events. You you see that happen quite often. In the, it, yes, they're races. Yes, these are competitions. But as a shared experience with a pretty small group of people in the grand scheme of things as well, you can really get to know everybody and, and, and share each other's journey along the way. And I'm glad you got to experience that. And that, that long stage has something of everything, right? It, it, like whatever you've experienced through the course, you get some of it over the course of that day. Um, were there any parts of the race that were particularly difficult for you? Were there, were there any times where you were really having to dig in to keep going? Um, I suppose like day one is kind of the eye opener. Um, like you're, you're full of energy. You've got the most calories in your body that you're going to have all week. Um, you start full of enthusiasm. We had kind of a road start. So it's really fast, great surface. So the first five or six K, um, possibly 10 K first checkpoint actually. Yeah. So yeah, about 10 K of that is a really fast section and you kind of don't know what to expect. And then you leave that and you go across the lake. So you're just learning, learning, and then the altitude after that, the climb. And me and James were in the lead, and James got his snowshoes on quite quick up there. Took me forever, and that's when he pulled away. And um, like it wasn't that it was mentally challenging, but I suppose that was that was just your first real introduction to it. And I kind of felt when he pulled away, I said, Do you know. He's younger than me. If he's faster than me, so what? It's a multi-day event. If he comes back into my race, we make a race of it, but I certainly wasn't going to try chase him down. And like you said, the snowshoes, I felt that they added a lever to your foot. So where your foot hinges on the front, I yeah. felt that I was going to put on due stress. Like the end of that section, you've a lovely downhill through forest kind of trails you could get considerable speed. The snow is soft, but you're in the snowshoes. But I just felt that you're putting an awful lot of stress on that joint. So I kind of took it handy. And I think I came in about 28 minutes after um, James that day. But what I didn't realize, he ended up picking up a foot issue, possibly running that section too fast. Um, and he went to Chris afterwards and asked, could he change shoes? Uh, she was out of a night bag, which I wasn't aware of, and he took an eight-hour penalty because that was deemed to be outside assistance because it wasn't in his race bag. But I wasn't yeah. aware of any of this. 
um, people at home watching your dot, they think that um, they think that we're aware of everything, but they have half the picture. We have half the picture. Yeah, they're understanding all these updates and they're getting all the media reports from that side. We're running the event, and like the minute you get over the finish line, stop the watch and get out of the wet gear, get food into it. Like there was times I didn't look at the time on the watch; I just stopped it because it wasn't very relevant. It certainly wasn't the most important thing to do there and then. You just had to get dry. Yeah, you've got your admin checklist to get through now. You've got to dry your kit. You've got to get a meal in, maybe two meals over the night. Where are my water bottles? Gather my kit together. Make sure I know where everything is for the morning. By the time you've done all that, it's time to start setting up and going to sleep. It, when, like the guys at the front, we were we were playing we were playing kind of more a dangerous game. Like we were getting into the checkpoints and the medics were like, Are you okay? And you'd be like, Yeah, I'm fine. Um I was probably consuming less fluids, but I was used to I'm used to that. The people at the back are on their feet longer, so they need more fluid. Yeah. I was also using a lot I was also using a lot less clothing. I found that I could go out with less clothes, you know, go to the start line each day cold. Um, knowing that the minute I go, I can sort of generate heat and trap it. And I found that, you know, by wearing a headband and having my ears covered and either hat on, hat off, gloves on, gloves off. Um, like I always had my base glove on, but I had three layers of gloves with me. So by he- having my hands warm, my head warm, I was able to have my chest cool and my legs a little cool. And I was able to run at that level. If I was slower, I would have had to put on more layers. So it, it's it's a very it's a very fine line when you make that decision of what to wear, and it has to be right for you and where you are in the race. Yeah, absolutely. Again, like we said with the kit before, it's it's very individual, and it, you you've got to respond to what's happening in front of you. It's not an environment that forgives you for having an issue and thinking, I'll let this go for the next three, four kilometers until I get to the next checkpoint. You kind of need to get on top of overheating or overcooling or if you feel like maybe you've got a layer to change, you've got to make yourself do it because, you know, your admin really can put you out of an event and into a very difficult situation really quickly out there, right? Oh, yeah, completely. There there was one time that I felt my hands did get cold on the lake section and I was I was in two layers of gloves and I was probably was probably a bit late getting the third layer on and the third layer are minus 30 um, but like once I got into them they're a big mitten with just a thumb out the side once I got into them I wasn't even looking for where that thumb goes it was just shove my hand in and that was it and about 10 minutes later I had full circulation back uh, it wasn't a problem. That was the only, that was my only issue at that one time where I probably left it a little bit late getting that glove on. But then there you go. That's where you'd done the work in advance and you had a third layer there. You had a system in place to cope with that if it happens. And and it's it's that kind of thinking that gets people through this race. If all it took was being strong and fast, there, there would be a, a lot more people competing up there for the podium it, it takes more than that and going back to the start of this you put a hell of a lot of planning into running that marathon in your you know your fire gear it seems like you've applied a similar level of thinking to what you've done here and that absolutely suits this kind of race so i don't think yeah, yeah i think uh, mentally i was putting more time i was thinking about this race all the time even when you're not running or you're not training, it's in the back of your head and it'll talk pop up and you're Googling different sports stores and looking at equipment and you're asking for people's advice and, you know, looking for podcasts like this, looking for the YouTube videos that you had done and that um, uh, basically they had put out on the channel. So yeah, I, I was looking at every nugget of information and seeing how I could make it relevant to me. Brilliant. I'm really glad to hear that. And you mentioned before you uh, you actually watched my video where I went into yeah. me only using the top of an electric toothbrush because it's just that little bit lighter than an actual toothbrush. And you went even further. Yeah, because like when you take the top of the toothbrush, 
it fans out at the bottom where it goes on to the electric toothbrush. So I cut that piece off as well where it fans out. So I brought a very small head of a toothbrush and then I brought these two kind of, they're like flossing sticks, um, which weigh absolutely nothing. So they were my, they were my dental and um, the sample toothpaste from the dentist, which is absolutely tiny. Um, you know, your hand gel, I squirted out half the bottle because I didn't need it. Um, Brilliant. Everything, like even the survival blanket, there was two survival blankets. So I had the really good one, uh, which you're not going to scrimp on weight uh, because if something goes wrong and you have to get into this, it's there for a purpose. But we also had to bring the really cheap one which is like a foil blanket based one that you can just buy cheap and cheerful. But I took it out of its packet and the packet comes with this draw cord and whistle and big toggle. I just put it into a freezer bag and I saved like another 15 grams or something. Um, all the food, um, your expedition food, your dry food, you can save possibly maybe 20 grams per packet, but not alone are you saving weight it packs far easier into your bag when you put it into a freezer bag because it'll take the shape of your bag. Whereas these foil containers are, la- they're designed for the food to last for five, seven, eight years uh, shelf life. You don't need that. You can repack it before you go and get it into your bag and it just gives you way more room. And I discovered as well that you can, you can pour the boiling water into a good quality freezer bag. So that's your bowl. I wasn't bringing a bowl and um, my my spork, I ordered one and it came and it was metal. And I was like, oh, I couldn't be doing with that. I have to find a plastic one. So we replaced that and got an 11 gram one or something. Uh, my ski goggles, I literally cut the band off it the day before I left. Um, and I replaced it with an elastic shoelace, like the triathletes have in their shoes. And I was well, like, that's perfectly functional. And I saved another 35 grams. So, yeah, like I was just short of cutting the straps off the bag. And (laughs) if somebody sponsored me the bag, I would have done that. But the fact that I paid for this bag and I may use it again in some other race, in some other capacity, I may need, you know, the straps set up in a different configuration. So I didn't cut the straps off. Um, But that's that's how brutal I was. The, The toilet roll. I basically plotted it, you know, over and back and basically put it into a freezer bag. So I wasn't bringing, I brought three quarters of a roll. I didn't bring the insert. Like if I could save a gram, there's so many places you're going to lose weight in the sense there's something you're going to put in the bag and that's said weight. You can't, you can't make that thing lighter. Like if you bring a phone, if you bring um, a battery pack for your phone, you know, there are things that you can't make lighter. So every other item that goes in the bag, we had to bring, was it 10 stormproof matches and we can keep the fire going. Now they came in a lovely plastic container. And when I looked at it, I think there was 20 in there. So the 10 matches got taken out and I brought a strike off a box of matches and I put that in a freezer bag, you know, a tiny little Ziploc bag. And again, so like I packed my bag, I unpacked my bag and then I weighed every item and I looked and I said, can I make it lighter? And then it was a case of, you know, there was one thing I brought tape for my uh, for my feet and I took it out and I goes, do you know what? I'm going to put in half roll of tape. And then I took out the half roll and I put back in the full roll because I said, if I need this, it's best to have a full roll. So there's things you can cut weight on and there's things you shouldn't cut weight on and you have to make that decision. That's brilliant. I love your approach to this. And honestly, Ed, it, it, there will be people who are listening to this for the same reasons you listen to our podcast and and watch the YouTube videos beforehand, and you've just given them so much right there. That is exactly exactly the kind of attitude you've got to have while you're preparing for something like this, because the more of that preparation you've done on the running, the more time you've been willing to put into that, the less things you've got to worry about while you're out there on the course, and, and you're going to have enough to think about running in the actual Arctic for five days. So brilliant i'm really glad you've got that out there that's that's absolute gold for anyone who's listening into this um and i guess on that note you know doing all that preparation in advance doing the hard stuff before race week allows you to enjoy that race week a little bit more and what 
what were some of the what were some of your favorite experiences out there on the course? Because I have great memories of the landscape and stuff out there. I'd I'd love to hear what you saw as you went through went through Arctic Sweden. Um, I suppose like in the first night when we were put out into the TP and you you know everyone that takes on this challenge would have probably spoke to someone that has been there before or watched the video and you go out and you're like put your sleeper bags down on the snow there's a reindeer skin that's the size of a small sheep and so you're like there was seven of us in the tent and I think we all more or less lied there during the night thinking everyone else was getting a great night's sleep and you're just zipped up in your sleeping bag trying not to be noisy and you're rolling around and trying to get a bit of comfort and the wind is blowing the tent and banging your head and it's like and it, it puts you in the mind frame for what's coming and you know it's yes it's a race um, but there's also a touch of an expedition about the event like it's it's obviously not an expedition uh, yeah, because but- there, is, there is a lot of care provided to us we have our medics we have our checkpoints and the organizer carries our sleeping bag and a, a night bag for us. So we just take the race bag. So we are supported a lot, but it definitely gives you the sense that, you know, if, if maybe one of these expedition races is for you, you, you touch on it and you, you do get a sense of the cold and just making your food. And so from that point of view, I just thought it's such a safe environment to give you the sense of if you want to take things further in a cold Arctic um, race environment. Um, the scenery, absolutely amazing, changing every day. Um, for me, the mountain was um, probably the best day. Um, I suppose I went into it, I think, 28 minutes down. So James started behind me. I, w- I, went, in as a, I went out as the leader. I knew I had to do well if James was still in contention. I just thought that he was going to get on top of his foot issue and chase me down. So I worked so hard on the mountain and but like I worked so hard but I still got to enjoy it so much. I still got to take in the view at the top. I briefly considered taking my phone out of my bag and like when I pack my bag I pack it with the sense nothing's coming out so everything is accessible um, my outer layer for my for my legs is in the pocket on the back. I have an extra top on the back, so they're all in outside pockets that I can access. My gloves are on the side. Um, my hat and stuff is in my jacket pocket. Everything is accessible, so I don't want to go into my bag. But that one time, I did consider stopping, opening the bag, and taking a photo of uh, the landscape because when you're on top of the mountain, you're above the cloud line, and you can see the clouds in the distance and the scenery and it would have been worth taking the photo if I felt that my camera would be up to it. And I just thought, you know what? This mobile phone is not going to do this justice. I'm just going to wait and see the official photos afterwards because they're going to take some good photos. So um, I don't think I, I don't think I ever took a photo anywhere in the race. Uh, I used the phone basically to touch base with home whenever we had a signal. Uh, some days you do, some days you don't. Um, and that was pretty much it. But um, scenery ones, yeah, the mountain for me was uh, was the big one. Yeah, it's special. It really, really is. Um, that's, where, that's where I got the National Geographic photo, the ice beard. Um, yeah, of course. I'd seen that. I didn't know where it was. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, like, oh, that, like, I don't tend to, um, I don't tend to frame many races or, you know, like some people put their numbers in a frame and their medal and, kind of the men's going to draw and you just kind of move on but uh, no I'll have to get that I think the medal now the number and that picture will go on the frame because you know where can you repeat that um, that day I think my my bottle froze um, and I remember as it was freezing I because they're a vacuum type bottle every time you you suck fluid out it sucks back in air so what I do is I, I'd squeeze it as I'm drinking and I keep the squeeze and then I take a few breaths and then I try to blow hot air back in. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's going to be effective or not, but I felt certainly kind of hurt. So maybe that delayed the freezing of the bottle. And I also think as well, when you're at the checkpoint, if you only fill your bottle three quarters, you then have a moving fluid in your bottle. So if, water, if you fill it full, 
and the water has no place to move. It's more stationary and it can freeze quicker. A moving fluid takes longer to freeze. You don't see it, you know, a moving river doesn't freeze the same as a, a puddle. A puddle will freeze a lot quicker. Um, so I was applying that logic. I would never fill my bottles totally. Um, again, um, it's it's just something I think made sense um, at the time, whether it actually did or not. Some people will say adding electrolyte into your bottle. Some people use hand warmers. Um, I actually made a neoprene sleeve from a wetsuit and put it around the bottle, but I found that it was just too awkward to get into my um, my pocket on the vest, on yeah. uh, the front running pouch. I should have, if I wanted to go down that route, I should have tailored the pocket. I should have had it taken off and resized. Um, so that, that was something that would have been worth doing uh, that I didn't do. Honestly, there, there's some great tips in this episode. I, yeah, I'm going to be pushing this interview in front of anybody who's looking for tips on uh, on how to prepare for the Ice Ultra. Because you, you've been incredibly thorough there and learned more from the experience you could take into other challenges. That's That's just exceptional. Also, I usually wrap up one of these interviews by asking, you know, what tips would you give to somebody coming in next year? I feel like you've 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 already given a dozen out there, which is, which is absolutely excellent. So I guess I'm going to go with the, a different tack here, which is, you know, you've done this, you've you've conquered the ice ultra out there in the Arctic. What's next? What 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 comes next for you? I don't know. Like for me, it's a case of four kids and a full time job, so. You know, when I hear people that have done, you know, every one of these events in a calendar year, I think, oh, wouldn't that be amazing? But, you know, I'd have to be a sponsored athlete to go down that road. So for me, it's like one, maybe two big events a year if I'm really lucky. Um, my name is in the hat to go back to Spartathlon. Um, so that's the end of September, um, early October. So if I don't get pulled out for that, I'll be looking for something around that time frame. Um, if you've anything in mind, um, I'd love to go to um, Mount Everest and do the ultra. So, like, they have the marathon and they have the ultra that go from base camp down. Um, yeah. Everyone thinks it sounds like a very easy race because you're running downhill. Uh, apparently, it's not all downhill and it's at severe altitude. So, there's a, an awful lot more to it than meets the eye. But, um, yeah, it'd be a great challenge. Uh, likewise, the BTU, I'd like to maybe possibly do the jungle and the safari. Um, is it the safari? The- I left the, the for Rangers Ultra, but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, that basically sounds appealing. Um, but I might have to book six uh, tickets to go to that one. The kids and wife are going to be coming out for that and stay nearby. Um, so yeah, that's you know the world. The world's amazing place. You uh, you meet people like we had a few South Africans over this year, and they were saying, you know, you have to push uh, Comrades Marathon on your bucket list. It was a race I was aware of, um, but I never kind of gave it too much thought. So, like, you meet people at these events and they start telling you other events. Um, the Arctic Spine is another possibility, whether, you know, in the next few years. I definitely could, uh, might have to learn a bit more navigation. I think there's a bit more navigation involved in that one. Yeah, certainly. And um, then again, maybe that's just a GPS yeah, unit that you can work with. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't know what's next. Um, I suppose when you come home from something like this, you, you come down off, off, off a big high. Everyone, um, everyone on the group was like putting up pictures of computer screens. They were back at work and it was like, we went from an environment where they challenged themselves. They pushed themselves so hard. They exceeded their widest expectations to now coming back. And it's like pre-race low. And they need to find another fix, I think. Um, so, yeah, there, there'll definitely be more adventures. Um, I'll keep packing them in as long as I can. Amazing. Well, I mean, if you keep doing amazing things, then uh, I, I look forward to talking to you on the podcast again. And I, I really do love the way you've approached these things. It's that, that thoroughness, that getting all the planning done in advance, and then making the most of the experience, which it really sounds like you did. You know, you you were fast over that hill because you knew you had to be, but you made the most of it. You you took the time to look out at the view. You you knew to 
stop pushing a little on that long day and share the experience with somebody and get everything out of it. And you're afforded those opportunities because you did so much planning and preparation on the run-in. And that's that's just such a great place to be. If I had, if I had ran the lead every day and finished that event, I would have come in at the end and I'd be announced as the overall winner and I would have looked around and I wouldn't have known any of these people because the winner of each stage, you know, the first three or four people go into a cabin, a hush or whatever, sometimes we bigger ones, but like there was times I was asleep before other people came in. So it can be a very isolated race to be at the front. Um, so I was so lucky that I had both experiences that I was at the front and that I got to share it with other people. Um, yeah, definitely. And just even hanging around the finish line for a while and seeing other people coming in and sharing their experience, you can see the emotion. And um, as I said to some other people, you know, my long day, I think I might have been, you know, something like 10 hours on my feet. Um, there was other people and they were closer to 20. So, you know, I'm just one part of this story. Um, I was fortunate to be at the front, but the people at the back, they equally have an amazing story. And, you know, I think you should go on and maybe feature someone on the back end because their story and their kit and how they would have overcome foot issues will resonate with a lot of people that will be taking this on next year as well. It's, you know, you won't just get all, like I may have imparted some information to people, but it may not be as relevant to them if they're going to go out and be in the middle of the pack or the back of the pack as someone else can tell them about the kick that they chose. Absolutely. Look, you're the first interview I'm doing for this podcast, but you are you are one of at least three guests we've got planned at the moment. I'm, I'm absolutely determined I'm going to tell the other end of that story as well. Um, you're, you're right. You, you can only tell us you're part of the story and, and these events are just too big for one person to be able to see it all. Um, but look, it, it, we've, we've hit the hour mark and I had been loosely aiming for something a bit quicker than that, but I, there was just so much good stuff to get out of this. So thank you for today. I, I've, I've really enjoyed chatting to you, Alex, and I think anyone listening to this will have learned a hell of a lot out of it. So congratulations once again and and thank you very much for taking the time today it's appreciated good morning then see you. how how are you good thank you it's good good thing here in sweden still enjoying the snow up in the north yeah apparently you enjoyed it so much out there you stayed on for a holiday um are you you having fun out there getting some skiing in uh, I was pretty so I think taking the ski lift up it was a challenge it was you know my legs were burning the, because it was the day after the race um, wow yeah. I mean I know people sometimes go for you know recovery runs the day after a marathon but um, full day of recovery skiing sounds pretty arduous after five days of ice ultra how, how are you doing with recovery are you are you feeling better now or are you still tired or carrying any soreness i just think people are always interested to get an idea of how long it really takes to bounce back from one of these things um i guess i was really lucky because i didn't have any injury at all i did not have any injury i don't know what happened but i was so lucky that i didn't even have a little blister or anything like that uh but of course, my leg was so swollen uh they were just elephant legs and feet the day after Probably took me three days of just uh, kind of like have my uh, legs elevated, and I was lucky enough because I'm staying with my parents, and they, my mom, just been cooking, looking after the children. So I just been lying my back, just eating, eating. I, you know, so hungry. <laughs> so- yeah, I bet. Yeah, you know what? I come back from doing one of these trips as a photographer, and I can I can barely stop eating for two days. Like out there running for the five days, you you've got some catching up to do. And I'm glad you are being treated like the hero that you are over there. That that is only appropriate. Um, it, so it, you you just completed the ice ultra, so congratulations on that. If I forgot to say that already, somehow. Um, and I think the reason I really wanted to talk to you is 
you know, I, I talk to the winners sometimes and their experience is, is really valuable for people to hear and always really interesting, but it's almost a different race the further down the field you get in terms of time. And, you know, not to take anything away from your achievement, but just to put it in perspective, there was 24 hours between you and the winner. And that means you spent 24 extra hours on the course in the cold, having to put up with those conditions. And that's that's an enormous challenge in and of itself. So I, I just wanted to dive into your experience a little bit. But um, before we get into that, I'd, I'd like to know a bit more about how you ended up at the Ice Ultra. Were you were you already a seasoned ultra runner, or was this a a, a big step for you going into something this this big? So I'm a I'm a trail runner and ultra runner. So I normally do probably two to four ultras per year. Officially, of course. I mean, we we training, we do a few of them unofficially. Of um, but my mindset has always been it be enjoying being out there, and for some reason, one of your video came up. I just absolutely fell in love with it. It was like a calling, you know. I was obsessed with it. I watch it and watch it and watch it. I reckon I watched it just forty times because I thought it was so beautiful. And um, you know, I watched it for so many years, and we went into COVID, and I was just about to sign up. And I didn't because I was a bit scared because I thought this is actually quite extreme. And then two of my really good friends was diagnosed with cancer. Within three months, they were both gone. And I was really taken back by the fact is, you know, life can be taken away from us so quickly. And I didn't want to waste it. I just did not want to waste and, you know, let the fear take over, take away this race I've always wanted to do. Um, and for some reason, my calling, I thought out there in the Arctic, I will have so much peace within me being out there with no one around and just pure nature. And wow. yeah, so I signed up and afterwards I thought, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> but, <laughs> I absolutely love every minute being out there. I mean, it's been taking yeah, you know, a whole year for me to prepare, of course, being, you know, based in Australia when we had 37 degrees, but, uh, when we tried to, I tried to train in, um, you know, the jacket, but also, uh, being based in Melbourne, we have a little bit of snow, but the snow is very different down there. It's wet snow. So it was testing gear, testing gear fell, buying new gear. And I mean, I've been so lucky that, uh, you know, our Mel- Melbourne University have sponsored me and let me tr- uh, train in the freezer. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you went and found a freezer to train in. That's, that's dedication. I like that a lot. Yeah. And I, I have to say, we kill a few treadmills in there because they just mm-hmm. couldn't handle <laughs> the cold. Um. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, you sign up for a destination, but it's just a whole journey. You know, you learn so much about yourself and but you have to reach out. I mean, reaching out, asking for help and advice, that's like a completely outside my comfort zone. Um, so it, it has been a big journey. So I signed up for a destination, but is this the journey? Um, just to, to get there. And I think most runners will probably feel that just to start getting to the starting line, we're just like, I got a little bit emotional because even the last couple of weeks heading toward, um, the race itself, I was terrified I was going to fall down the stairs. I was grabbing, you know, the staircase carefully. <laughs> Every time someone calls, I thought, oh, that's it. I'm going to get COVID. I'm going to get COVID. <laughs> It's nerve wracking, isn't it? When you've when you've invested so much emotion and energy and time in something, yeah, I, I can completely understand that. And I've heard that said by a lot of runners over the years. A family member sneezes, and that's them out of the house. Like you live you live in the shed now. Um, and you you touched on something there that I think is is particularly interesting. Like. Quite a few of our runners come from the UK when they do this event. Our, our organization's based in the UK. And, you know, I've 
I did the Ice Ultra as well back in 2017, a long while ago now. And training over there seemed difficult because we don't get a lot of snow and it isn't anywhere near as cold as in the Arctic. But I was still getting, you know, zero degree days and a little bit of snow here and there. You were having to find a way to train for this where it was 30 plus degrees over in Australia. And that's that must have been really tough. So, I mean, how long were you spending in a freezer killing treadmills to try and acclimatize for this? You know, each time we put a treadmill in there, it will probably run for 45 minutes and then it will stop because of the, the temperature. So we will have to take the treadmill out and then I will have to run up and down in, in the fridge. But also that that was also, a, a, I find it quite easier because I have more room to move instead of standing on a treadmill hours after hours and also, I guess it's just not about getting your condition, like your your fitness in that room. It's about testing your gear as well. You know, like I remember we have, I mean, in, in that fridge, in that fridge, they have ten fan blowing. Even though it's, it, uh, we set it to minus twenty with all that commercial fan, it went. It felt like minus twenty eight or thirty. And I remember I tried to put my snowshoe with all my gears on. It was so uncomfortable. And I took my gloves off because I tried to set the the, the strap. And within less than 20 seconds, my fingers was hurting so much. And I was just like, okay, I cannot expose my hand. That's it. That's it. It's taking too long to even warm my fingers. But also because I stopped for so long putting my snowshoes on, I start to cool down really quickly. I was so shocked. Within 30 seconds, I was cold and I wanted to get out of that room. I thought, this is a controlled environment and I'm feeling like this. So out there, I can't get anyway. I'm going to get stuck there. So everything has to be calculated, you know. Like, I mean, and I felt that when I was out there. Uh, at one stage, I thought, wait a minute. I have not practiced to put my batteries in, in the dark. What if my batteries, my head torch goes flat and I have to put this in the dark? I haven't practiced this. So uh, it was a few hours thinking, okay, okay, I you know, can't thinking how I'm going to do this in the dark. Uh, but thank goodness I didn't have to use that skill. <laughs> uh, but excellent that you were preparing for that. And I think th- that experience is really important. And if anybody is listening to this, planning on doing the Ice Ultra or a similar cold race or, or, or something along those lines, you've just touched on a, a really good point. Like, no matter what it looks like, if you've got to find a walk-in freezer somewhere, whatever you've got to do, if you can find a way to test your kit in the closest conditions you can, it's really going to help because then you learn stuff like what you learn. It is so hard to just stop and change your clothes to take your gloves off. You've got to think of everything, haven't you? Where, When I take my gloves off, where will I put them so I don't lose them? What is my system for doing this as quickly as possible? There's there's no decision in the ice ultra or, or in any very, very cold environment that you can take quickly or take lightly. You, was that your experience out there, would you say? Yes, absolutely. Um, I I feel like knowing how your gear and the materials will react in that condition is quite important because I had I actually originally I had a different pair of snowshoes but after being in the freezer for a few times I just noticed like I stopped and I took too much time just to put the strap on because the strap on the plastic strap becomes so stiff I couldn't put it in so in the last minute I ordered a pair of new shoes yeah all this time I've been training with my snowshoes on the beach um, I end up taking a brand new shoes without having trained in it. I thought, you know what? Oh. I deal with new blisters, but I can't deal with dying out there because I'm cold. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but, fair uh, enough. I mean, if it's one or the other, it's blisters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it, so, I mean, and did the snowshoes you bought work out in the end? I take it. You, you said you didn't get any blisters. So that obviously turned out to be the right decision. They were much lighter and um, the strap were easier to put on and adjust. You, you preset it, so that saved me a lot of time. However, because 
you wear them all day uh, by, I think that was the, sec- the first day when they had to take them off, the medic had to pour hot water on the strap to get them off. So, you know, you like you practice, put them on, put them off without the, uh, with the gloves on, but by the end of it, you can't because they're frozen. So is it that decision you go like, okay, if I don't wear my shoes, they're going to stay on all day because there's a chance that they, I don't manage to, to take them off. So it is that decision. Do I stay in them or do I not stay in them? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, some people hate the snowshoes and will do anything to get out of them. But I know when I did the race, I was the same as you. My buckles froze up during the first day and I, I decided that was it. I'm just not taking them off then. I, it, unless they cause me terrible blisters or, or something like that, I'm just going to keep them on all day and live with it because having to stop and try and melt all the ice off was going to take far too long. So it was it was one or the other. Um, I sympathize. <laughs> I, know, I know what that moment was like. Um, but I'd, I'd like to go back just a little bit, sort of just before the race. You're sort of coming into this Arctic environment, and I know what it's like that first night before the race. They put you in a tent, so you're now going to be sleeping outside in the Arctic. How was the day and the night before the race? How were you feeling when you got there? Oh, gosh, it was quite intimidating. You know, you look around, you see all this, you think, oh, my God, that guy is definitely a lead soldier. She must be a lead uh, runner. You know, and I'm just an average person who just, you know, working full time, have young children. And here I am going to embark on this enormous challenge, having the whole Australia cheering me on. And so I thought I better not stuff this up. I just so it was quite daunting, but I constantly keep um, going through the the points that I, I well bring, I brought with me, which is one of the things was just to keep the noise out and to trust my training. You know, just trust what I've done will be enough, uh, and also just knowing that everyone else have the everyday life. Everyone's you know, none of us are paying running full time. I mean, sure, there may be someone, but probably 90% of people there have children, have work, have everyday thing they have to deal with. So we start equal and it is, you know, and, and also remember why I was there as well. It wasn't just, you know, to be honest, I wasn't there to win the race. I want to complete the race and I want to enjoy it, enjoy it. And, you know, and, and I did, I, I, I com- completely enjoy every single minute like every single minute and I I have been really keep it really low how much I loved being out there because I know there was a lot of runners even though they, they enjoyed it there was a lot of low moments for them but for me I just didn't I didn't have a low moment because I was I it, it was part of the journey I didn't sign up because it was gonna be you know a luxury hotel or anything like that it was I signed up because it was going to be a challenge. It was going to be difficult. So I have my moment when I felt like this, this, <laughs> this leg is never going to end. But, you know, but my first night out on, on TP, it was, uh, it was an experience. I knew there was going to be some, you know, guy, guys with uh, an army background. And, and for some reason, I, uh, Jump on the um into a TP with another strain, and in there they were just guys, and they had all some kind of um, army training. They just jump in a sleeping bag, bang, slept. I was there, you know, tried to like get my sleeping bag, put all the layers on. I was so cold, it was so windy, and um, you know, being the single female, I went out of TP twice to go. <laughs> <laughs> go to the toilet and, oh. the sec- <laughs> and the second time I felt terrible um, because I keep going in and out and when the second time I came in one of the guys sleeping next to me I looked over and he was he did not have any, any top one he was completely naked on top he was sweating I was so cold <laughs> Fitting uh, out in my night bag, trying to find some emergency hand warmer that wasn't working. I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I, I probably had a half an hour sleep and an hour sleep. Um, and I thought, 
this is what they have done. They have really pushed us out of our comfort zone before we even get to the starting line. Okay, the, okay, this is this is what I signed up for. But I have to say, it's, I, sorry, it's a strange experience that one because we. If you go back quite a few years, there used to be another night that you spent in a tent as well, but sort of quickly realized that when you're four days into the race, if you put everybody in a tent while they're sleep deprived and calorie deprived and tired, not a great idea. So we scrapped that, not doing that anymore. But Chris has always kept in having the tents there the night before the race kind of for that reason like it is quite uncomfortable you're not going to get a great night's sleep but it it's sort of anybody who might have come into the event feeling a little overconfident understands the environment a bit more after a night in a tent at minus 25 or 30 it's it, it is it's it's sort of meant to be an introduction to what you're going into like this is going to be hard but i'm sorry i don't know if the intention was for it to be quite as hard as that <laughs> We'd have hoped you'd got more than thirty minutes sleep, but yeah. Oh, I, wow. I I still love that because I that's this is what what I love about ultra running is, you know, especially today's International Women's Day, and you know, shout out for all the women who's doing this. It's just a small percentage of us, and yeah. uh, but what I love about ultra running is, it is the fairest game out there. You know, it does not discriminate if you're male, you're female, how old you are, and all that. And I know this, so many like people who are, um, you know, their age are much higher than me, and they they kick my butt because they are experienced and they just. I reckon ultra ultra running, you just become better with the age. You just just experience. You know yourself. You know your body, and you know when it's time to cut the noise up. Is you know when you have to bring people along. Um, so you know that. I love that we're ultra running, especially that first night. I was like, yep, we all equal now. Doesn't matter you are elite runner. You have terrible sleep as well. She was cool like me. So we just yeah. like. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I do love that. There's, it, it doesn't matter who is in that race. You're all in the tents. You are all equal. You all get onto that start line, sleep deprived and wondering what hit you the night before. It's, um, yeah, it's a great equalizer. So then. We've we've got you to the start line now in the story. We've had a slightly disturbed night lying on a reindeer skin in the snow. Um, how was that first day? And I, I'm I'm asking that, thinking back to when I was out there on the first day, and I, I you know I think I was somewhere in the region of terrified for that entire first stage. There's so much to learn there. So how was the experience for you? Oh, um. I think when we first crossed the first leg and I just saw the mountains and the snow and the air so crisp, I just, I think I felt really, really grateful that I was actually doing it. Just the privilege to be able to do that. And I just couldn't believe that we have all this team who just parade around us for us to you know, to stay safe and there are what to, to, to running over the eyes and taking some photo and it was it, I just couldn't believe it I just it felt like it was a dream it was a dream that I've had for so long and I'm just like oh I have to pinch myself I nearly burst out of happiness I was like I'm doing it I'm doing it you know uh, for me I, I felt like it was it was a, re- a dream that came true first day yeah I was so pleased for you I, I, I think it took me at least until the morning of the second stage to get over being sort of intimidated by it. I'd, I'm really glad to hear you just embraced it from the get-go, like you were just enjoying that course. And uh, what had you, I mean, you had spent time in Sweden earlier in your life, yeah? Yes. Uh, so had you seen that area of Sweden before? No. And this is the thing, this is why I signed up for this. I thought, uh, I, I grew up in Stockholm and went to boarding school school of up in North, but I have never been that far up. And I just couldn't believe it, especially the first day. I was like, this is Sweden. This is like my country, you know, and it's just so stunning. It's just, I just can't believe it. I have truly fell in love with Sweden again. Like 
you know, I used to parade about Australia, a little bit of Thailand, but kind of like forgotten about how amazing Sweden is. And and let's not forget of, you know, the Sami people. I just love them. So amazing. They're just so incredible people. I just don't know how they survive out there. You know, it's just like, how do you do this the whole year? And this is almost, I mean, we had it quite warmer condition compared with previous year, but I just don't know how they did it. And I I would just fell in love with Sweden. I just fell in love with it. That's wonderful. It, to, to go back to Sweden somewhere you had spent a lot of time and, and to see it in a whole new way and on foot. I mean, it, the areas that you are in, especially in the early parts of that race, are so remote. It's not like you're bumping into other hikers out there on the trail. It is, it's you and the other people in the Ice Ultra, and that's it. And not many people have seen those trails on foot in the middle of winter and taken the time to see those mountains in those conditions. And yeah, um, oh, this is good. I'm sensing your excitement now. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting how you felt on that first day because it really is stunning, the scenery out there. Yes. Uh, um, I, I and this. I'm oh, sorry. No, no, all good. I, I feel like you know, um, being a big part of me enjoying the race was soaking in the Sami's energy, the the calmness they have out there is ridiculous. You know, they just this is what is. You know, it's just so for me. I try really hard to soak up the Sami's calmness do you know when they say um there's a saying say the storm is always louder outside the, uh, inside the tent so and so a lot of the time i try to i guess get to know sami and obviously bt the staff as well but uh the locals they're just so much calm about all things so even so you know i i don't think i will have it will will have enjoy and being so calm it wasn't because of the Sami people I'll make sure that they hear that because they, they really are an amazing team and it's it's odd it, you've been preparing for a year to be in that extreme environment and it, it, even the guys working behind the scenes we might have been there a few times but it's still out of our natural element we we don't live in those conditions we, we still have to really think about it and prepare and bring our warmest best kit out there with us for the Sammies, it's just an average Tuesday. Like that's it, that's how they'd get from place to place anyway on the snowmobiles. They they live there so easily in an environment that's that seems so extreme to us. And yet, great bunch of guys. So uh, hi to the Sammy team. Hopefully, you're listening to this. Uh, and um, a lot of people, when they describe the first day of the Ice Ultra, talk about how much there is to learn. So you know you. You can prepare for a lot of things in training, and I think you did particularly well thinking about running in snowshoes on the beach to try and get used to those and going into that freezer and and killing um, running machines in there. But there's still, it's different actually being there. And on the first day, you've got a couple of significant climbs. It's going to be very cold. You're going to encounter some deep snow. It's a It's a steep learning curve. Um, did you find it that way as well? Uh, in between bouts of just thoroughly enjoying yourself? Um, yeah, I think um, to get... I mean, it's all about balancing for me out there. Like uh, my Achilles heel is definitely my stomach. So for me, not vomiting or have issue with stomach was, was a big challenge. And I just knew that I have to keep everything at... To be honest, I think I, I did the race at 75 or 80% of my capacity because I just, uh, for me, I, I remember at one stage I was feeling really weak uh, because you just don't get enough calories in regardless how much you eat. Uh, but I just didn't feel to eat. And I just remember reminding myself, say, it is an infinite race. You might not be the fastest, but you're going to be the one that stay in this race the longest. And so I just opened up my drink bottle where I have put my breakfast porridge in it and just drinking it. And it just tasted terrible, but I thought calories, calories, every single thing counts calories. So it's, it's 
you know, you do all different kind of trainings, but also it is very important that you you know your body mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually as well. Know it, what to do about when you're low on it, and it's, it's constantly tapping into yourself. You know, when I felt sick and I thought, wait a minute, I am, I have been drinking pretty good on this uh, leg, and I've been dr- eating pretty well. I felt a bit nauseous, and then I caught myself. I was breathing very heavily because it was, it was like this blizzard. I couldn't see where I was going, and 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 it was nighttime. There was snowing. I couldn't put my goggles on because it was dark, and so I caught myself breathing really heavily. And to just to breathe in all that air can make you feel really sick. And and at that stage, I have decided not to take my um have my snowshoes, but I went through deep snow, and I thought I have really stuffed this up. Um. So I was a bit nervous. So in that moment, I have to actually remind myself I just stop breathing so heavily and trust on the gear because I, I got a bit scared because I thought I'm in the middle of the dark and there's snow blizzards. I can't see where I'm going. I'm getting really fatigued. So I really have to tap onto myself that trust your training. You're not going to drop dead because you just haven't eating for whatever just just control your breathing so yeah just i think just know yourself what's wrong and what you can do about it i think that's those are very wise words and it's it's very easy in circumstances like that to give into those feelings and for your natural instinct to be well i I must push harder i've got to get out of here i i I have to get to the next checkpoint i've i've got to i've got to move and you're only going to dig that hole deeper you're now going to be hotter sweatier breathing deeper more nauseous what you did there was perfect you you took the time to assess how your body was feeling how your mind was feeling I, you know what is and isn't working here and what can I do and you you found a way through it and it's it's exactly that kind of thinking I think that that you really need on this race and I think especially when you are going to be out on the course for longer like if you're right at the front of the pack and you're only ever running in daylight you're probably in lightweight gear and moving very quickly you might think to yourself well I'll just push a little harder and get to the next checkpoint or, or get to the finish line and you've got tons of recovery time before the next day. For you, you, I think you have to really concentrate on that, managing yourself and managing your kit properly. And it sounds like you did really well there. Is that how do you? What do you attribute that to? Because that really is something that people tend to learn from repeated experience of being in these environments. How how did you? How did you know to do that? How did you know to be that way and to keep yourself calm? I guess this I have been running for a lot of years and I, I think just just before I left Australia I was up hiking and I ran into two runners who were dressed really lightly and they were fast runners and they got in so, uh, themselves in trouble because uh, they got really cold. The weather, the, the condition, the weather changed really quickly. She was suffering with hypothermia and she fell. And it just kind of remind myself that, yes, everything is fine as long as you can keep moving. But the unknown, when you stop, that is when you need your gear. So I've always been that kind of person who always prepare for the unexpected. So my friends always laugh at me that I always have so much um, with me. But it has what I have carried had saved lives, um, and you know I think when we prepared when we did it uh, gear check, everyone was laughing. Oh, other runners because I have so much stuff that uh, I could literally open a new adventure store. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, it's it's also the the uh, the Swedish training that we always it's never never ever we have a saying that it's never ever bad weather. It's just bad clothing bad preparation so you know as long as you have all the gear that you you might need you know you can't prepare for every single situation but at least you know that you have the gear to deal with it um and 
with me growing up in Sweden have had the advantage because we all this we have had that cool training. We just know when it's time to, uh, you know, when you feel that you start to sweat, it's like you need to let that heat out. But then also, don't forget to know that okay, all the heat is out now. You actually cold that it's time to zip up. So there's a uh, you know this is something that we have within us that let the heat out uh, until that is you know that my our favorite word is log on, which means that the perfectly right temperature. Everything is, has to be log on. Uh, you can't push too hard. You have you, know, you have to be warm enough. Log on, warm log on speed. Uh, that's how you survive. Uh, and that was my g- game plan. You know, I just didn't want to win. I mean, we would have been lovely to win, but it, that was that wasn't my goal. I wanted to enjoy it and come back home to my children safely. You know, because it, it does it. It is costly for the, everyone who's involved for a person to get to the ice ultra. You know, the sacrifice from family members, uh, not just from yourself. So it has to be a fair, fair game for everyone. And no doubt, no doubt, ju- juggling, you know, family and work commitments around this. The, you need a support network of people willing to help you along the way as you're doing this and willing to sacrifice little things themselves in order to support what you're doing and i you know i, I that's not to be underestimated um also i i love that you uh you have this sort of ingrained swedish training what was that word again for the the perfect temperature the perfect speed logom it's mean perfectly Logan. right perfectly well balanced that's excellent. You you hit on something earlier as well when you said that you you didn't really feel like you pushed harder than maybe 75, 80% or something like that during the race. And I, I, I meant to pick you up on that at the time because that sounds perfect. It, 100% is not sustainable. You, you can't afford to overexert and sweat or to get too cold. So that, that sweet spot, I'm going to remember that word. Now, I'm thinking about, again, that comparison between the people at the front and the people at the back. The, the people at the front tend to manage that temperature by managing the intensity of their effort. They, they'll be wearing very light layers and they keep themselves warm by consistently pushing hard and moving very quickly. And and they're able to maintain their log room. A terrible pronunciation, I'm sure. But they're able to maintain that by just moving really fast all the time. And that... that it, that's great. That works for them. Um, often they don't even dip into most of their warm layers. But when you're further back, I think that management's a little harder. You, it's now it is about managing your kit, really, isn't it? Because those are the things that you can control when you do enter freezing cold lake sections, which are definitely colder than when you're in woodland, which is definitely colder than when you're marching up the hills, which are really, really tough. I mean... How did you find that experience? I I think I went through more costume changes than Lady Gaga would in a concert. Like it, it, it was all the time. Um, I I think Chris did, did mention be brave and start cold. Uh, mm. That brave, I started to be warmer and I took it off. Uh, but I managed to get that on the second day, cor- uh, quite um, quite perfectly. Actually, to be honest, I started cold. And then it's kind of like, I, I looking back, it is a routine. You know, start cold and then the sun comes out, you warm up. And then, um, and then in the middle of the day, you start to dip into more like your nutrition and water. And then on the fourth, fifth, sixth legs, oh, sorry, checkpoint, that's when you start to manage your body temperature. So the layers comes on. I mean, I make the mistake by I put in one layer too much and I got really hot and in the yard, you feel nauseous because you're, you're just so hot. You can't breathe properly. So I, I have, I managed that, but I think it's important that it's not just about the cal, how much calories you burn when you're cold, like because you obviously burn so much more calories, you're shivering. Uh, so that's, it is important to keep your body warm. Uh, from the calorie point of view, but also emotionally, um, spiritually, mentally, I feel like I felt that I that I felt safer when I was had that the right temperature. Even though in the snow blizzard, when I was warm, I felt that 
my my gear, my kit, my body. That was my house, but I was warm and slept inside. I can continue all night if that requires from me. So it, it is really important not to be too hot, but just to enough snugly that you feel safe out there because there's going to be time you, you, you feel quite, you know, that you're in danger, but you, I mean, you're not because the team is out there. But it's important that you feel safe and trust your gear when you're out there. I mean, you know, you, I know that we spend thousands of dollars on the, the most advanced gear. So trust that and getting to know your gear, I think it's important. Absolutely. And um, what? how was the long day for you? Because especially as a runner who is, you know, maybe a little further down the field, the long day is long. I don't, you know, I've, I've known people take 20, 21, 22 hours to, to clear that course. How was, how was that experience for you? I love the long days. I <laughs> uh, see you. You're amazing. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I, what I love about this race is every day it was a new adventure. I like, I'm like, okay, today we got the mountain, we got the hills and you get to test your training that way. You see the scenery changes. And then we got the frozen lake. I mean, it was going to be a long frozen lake. Then, you know, it, it's, that is your mentally capacity training. That That's where it comes in because you see nothing but frozen lake. And it's just like darkness, darkness. And it said light. No, there's another head torch out there. I was like, oh, you know, so it, it, it tested you from the different way. So every day I was, I was quite excited for a new challenge. You, you were never tested. It's the same way. Even your muscle, you know, the second day you just climb and climb and climb and you went down and down. And then on the frozen leg with a snowshoe, it felt like, you know, like I was being punched on the Back on the treadmill. (laughs) Gosh. But, um, uh, gosh, it's, uh, I, I, I loved it. I loved the long days because, because that's what we sign up for. You know, we call it long day for for a reason. I mean, I didn't sign up for it, and yeah, I think I will probably I will have been a little disappointed if I sign up for it and I finish um, a, a day within whatever hours because I want to make the most of it being out there. It's uh, I I remember I had um, two South African runners in front of me. And I was just looking down this frozen lake, just like just beating this frozen lake, just being, just trying to, uh, you know, keep moving. And then I looked up and they have stopped. And they turn and, and then they were taking photos of some houses along the, the, the frozen lake. And I thought, gosh, I have forgotten to actually enjoy this. Do you know? So there's always pleasure in every single lake. So, and, even the longer days, you know, I was out there and I loved it. I loved running in, in the dark. Um, you know, it's, um, you see the moon, the moon, one of the days where it was, it was so still. It was so still. And an Austrian runner, uh, reminded me, he said, you don't need your head torch. So I turned off my head torch. I ran for hours through the forest and it was this moon. It was so stunning, and I just like I can't believe it. Was um, and then on the long day, it was snow blizzard, and it, it was so scary. I couldn't see, I couldn't see anything. But among all this chaos, I looked up, and there was this big moon behind all this snow, and it was still stunning. You know, it just. For me, I, I I just love every single minute of being out there. It, it sounds like a fairy tale. I could be totally naive and oblivious, but you know, sometimes it helps being a little bit naive. To be honest, I I don't I don't think naive is what's coming across to me. Like I'm I'm jealous that you managed to enjoy it as much as you did. I, I think I when I look back at my experience, I let parts of it intimidate me too much to look up sometimes. So I I just think that's wonderful. But I think you've also got to give yourself the credit for having done enough training and research and preparation 
to be able to have that faith in the system that you've made in in your kit and to to be in that log room condition in your in your little house there so that you could take those moments to look up in the middle of a blizzard and appreciate the view that I, I, that's wonderful Sierra. and i i there's a there's a lesson in there not just about you know, I'm a, I'm a geek for outdoor equipment. I, I it's like Christmas, like walking into a toy shop when I go into a hiking gear store. I get that. I love that aspect of it. But a lot of the preparation here is about getting yourself ready so that you can have that faith in your kit and relax just enough to be able to enjoy it. So, I mean, if, if anyone listening to this, my advice at the end of this podcast would be be more seer. Just, just be more Sierra about this and you're going to have a great time. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say naive at all. I, I think you you did enough preparation to be able to really revel in the race week and that's that's fantastic. Sorry, there's no question in there. That's just that's just praise. Thank you. I also want to add for anyone who actually is thinking to sign up for this kind of race and they might not have that environment, the perfect environment to train in. I feel, because I also felt like that before I, I, I came here and I had a, some terrible race and signed up for a few ultra ultra races and I, I just went pear shape. You know, one of it I was vomiting six times. I was uh let's not talk about every other uh Yeah, we've been there. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was beating myself so much about it and then I, I did another race. And it took me 25 hours. I wanted to be out there for, for as long as I can to, uh, I guess, get to know my body, what we we'll do when I'm that fatigued. Uh, and I felt terrible because uh, I just kind of like felt like I should have been fast and all that. But I think um, those kind of training, when you feel like you've fail are really really important because you really that's when you actually getting to know yourself and it's not about how your body repairs but just about what emotion comes out when you you in that situation and they're all so vital to preparation for uh, the ISO job because you, you have to let your body feel those emotions but also let it pass as well just pick yourself up and move on and just remember you have had that experience film shit but you just have you move on yeah it, it won't last forever you will feel better there there is the way out is through and you will get through and I, I think that's great advice as well we we talk to people when they ask us about training that you know back-to-back sessions are important go and do a day where you exhaust yourself and then make yourself get up the next day and do something again. Like know what it feels like to start something exhausted and and feel your body in that condition, because you are going to feel like that at some point in the race, and you're going to need to find a way of pulling yourself out of it. And you will be able to, and you can have faith in yourself to do that if you've already been through it in training. So I, yeah, what do they say? Train hard, run easy, or train hard race easy i think is is how i've heard it put before yeah amazing well look um i'm gonna i'm gonna skip you ahead in the race slightly now to the finish line because i'm i'm intrigued you were you were so happy all the way through this race by the sounds of it how happy were you at the finish line i mean what 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 was that like actually getting there and you've achieved this thing at the end of this year-long journey Oh, I guess it was a bit sad because I just wanted to see more. Um, but at the same time, it was a lot of weight that was lifted away from my shoulder because I, it's, it has been, it took me a whole year to prepare for it, obviously, being a mom. Um, so you, you never really get that 100% training in, you know, I always felt like I only get 40% or 30% training in. So I guess I'll tackle it with, Okay, if I'm only going to get 40% of training, I will just have to start earlier than everyone else. Now approaching how, how can I do this? Um, so when I came through, I was just so happy. It just, you know, that medal was huge. It's so big medal. And like, and it's like, no one else is going to have this big medal as mine. Um, and also, you know, there's just so many people that are behind me, you know, back home. It's just, 
my friends, my colleagues, my sponsors, you know, the whole university. There's just like, you know, I signed up for something that I've always dreamed to do. And it turns out I was, you know, it turns out to be a big thing. Obviously, running the Arctic in Australia is, is no one has ever heard of it. So I was on the news. I was, uh, you know, on this article written about it. So I thought, thank God I finished it. There was a huge weight in lift on my shoulder. And I think half was like, it felt like half was straight. It was like, it's like, it's like following me on everything without that. And I just constantly talking to those people you in the race say i'm so sorry did you want me to win this but i just do i just sign up for myself i'm so sorry i want to enjoy i want to really milk it every single minute of being out here so um yeah i'm just really happy that i can go back with a medal to show people this is what you invested and thank you for believing in me so fantastic and uh, you know what see given how much you achieved from what you went out there to do you know you you wanted to complete you did it you wanted to get the best out of the experience and it sounds like you absolutely did you wanted to enjoy it and thrive out there and I, that's really coming across in what you said and you you did the work to have earned that like I, I you know in that sense I really would consider you a winner here because that's that's win after win after win to me um I I I've really enjoyed talking to you today and sort of hearing about the race from your point of view because it, it, this really sounds like somebody who has really embraced the whole journey and got the absolute maximum out of it. So, I mean, well done. Absolutely amazing. You you deserve that big medal. Perhaps we should have found an even bigger one. I'll, I'll talk to Chris before the next event. <laughs> My suitcase full of gear that I'm taking back home. So there's, there's not room for anything else. My parents is like, "Are you gonna leave all this stuff?" I was like, no, I'm not leaving anything behind, Mom. I'm like, no way. My- yeah. <laughs> and that was uh, your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I think what I love about the whole journey that I have opened so many people's eyes for ultra running. And I think a lot, it was, it was really fun because I think, um, I, I remember when I finished the race and I got so many messages. I, um, you know, I, I, I it was, I felt like a celebrity, you know, and, um, and then I called someone who was like, I want to pay on you to let me, let you know I'm, 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 I'm safe. And this person just saying, you know, I've been following this dog for five damn exhausted. I'm still going to bed now. So, you know, we have. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I have, I felt like uh, I have half a country following this dog through the Arctic. I opened so many eyes for this sport and also this part of, wor- of the world. Um, some people didn't even know what ultra running is. Wow. Amazing. Well, it's thank you for being, a, you know, Ultra Running's ambassador in Australia now. That's absolutely astonishing. Um, and yeah, look, I'm I, I'm not going to keep you any longer. That's I said this would be a quick interview, but it was just so nice talking to you. And and frankly, I always say they're going to be quick interviews, and then I always get carried away. But hey, this has been a pleasure. So thanks for taking the time today, Sia. It's it's greatly appreciated. Thank you for having me. Oh, one last thing after that. You were running for charity. Do you, could you tell us a little bit about that? And then I'll pop a, a, a link in the description and stuff. Yes. So I am raising money to uh, rebuild a school. Uh, it's not a big amount, but I, I would like to add a toilet or a shower to the school in Thailand. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's incredible when you decide to sign up. Um, fundraising for something uh, but there's a bigger picture because I have had so many emails and uh, messages from people in Thailand and just say you know I thank you for being the female role model in ultra running because and then it made me really think that oh my god I grew up I didn't have that role model either so you know there's um I guess there's a there's a role I play now which is much more important than I should just try to fix a school just being a role model in ultra running, in in you know representing women in these sports, and 
it's not just about women. It's uh, I, what I love about these sports is uh, all the men who encourage women to be out there and just kick ass, really. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, so I'm fundraising to rebuild school, and I will uh, I'll gonna go down there for Christmas, and we're gonna I'm gonna try to get uh, this toilet and shower going for all these kids. Because at the moment, I think they only got two toilets with 200 kids out in North Oh, wow. Where I was born. Wow. Incredible. Well, look, if you're listening to this, the link is below. <laughs> Go and have a look. Um, and yeah, it, 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 see it. That's absolutely incredible. I mean, you're doing something great there for the charity. But as you say, it's bigger than that. You've you've set you've set a bar. You've you've become a role model now. And yeah, you know. I'm inspired talking to you and that's as a, you know, just another middle-aged white dude from the UK. Like it, it, what you represent is, is fantastic. And I'm, I am genuinely so happy for you. And may there be dozens and dozens of seers in every race I turn up to in the future. And that, that would, that would make my day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm rather honored and surprised that you asked me to be part of this. And I'm really, really glad I did. It's, it's been a pleasure. So genuinely this time. I'm going to sign off and let you get on with your holiday, but thanks very much, Sia. Thank you, Will. Bye.